This conference will now be recorded. All right. I'm going to call this meeting to order. This is the <clears throat> Town Council Subcommittee meeting on the ARPA funds. Today is Tuesday, March 15th. We're going to rise for a moment of silence, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, Deb, I see you're online. Do you want to call a roll call or did you want me to call it? Oh, no, I can do it. Thank you. Welcome. Allenson? Here. Laughing. Here. Tata. Here. Testa. And Zandri. Here. Thank you. We have four of the five members. Um, Deb also note that Mandy Miranda from Youth and Social Services is here, as well as Tim Ryan for Economic and Development. Uh, did I miss any other government people? No, okay. All right, we're gonna start with the first item, which is to approve the minutes from the last meeting. Is there a motion to do so? So moved. Second. Second. Moved and seconded, uh, moved by Councilor Zandri, seconded by Councilor Tata. We'll just do a voice vote. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Aye. Being none, sent, uh, no abstentions, motion passes. Uh, for the rest of the meeting, so we have four agenda, um, we have three other agenda items. <clears throat> the first is discussion of possible action regarding not for profit draft applications and involvement in the process. That's the first item we're starting with, and I think that's what a lot of you are here for today. A lot of the nonprofit people are here. The second item is to cover any additional draft outline application process stuff for the other items that the the other counselors may want to do we may get to that point and be like we're done we, it's been four and a half hours and we're all set we don't want to continue on for the rest of the night but we have the agenda item posted in case we need it and the same thing goes for item number six which is discussion of possible actions uh, and that is a broad scoped agenda item just to cover any um, action that we may need to do if we feel as a committee that we need to send it back to the council for anything um, we're going to go through, uh, we always start with counselors and government uh, comments, and we'll go to public and nonprofit. Um, I'll try and keep it uh, flowing. Um, we do want to try and focus on, if we can, on the draft applications or the on the involvement of the nonprofits in the whole process. Uh, if you'd like to say anything, you can comment over in the chat bubble thing. And I'll do my best to, I'll be checking on that. And uh, I try and just go in the order that we take them when we call on it. Uh, don't necessarily jump in all right now. Um, let's let the, the council people start first and, and see where we are. Um, we are going to start with where we left off last time, which was uh, Maria Harlow and Liz Davis had volunteered to work on draft documents for the nonprofits um, and that were sent to us as a as a mechanism or a manner of kind of speeding up the process and keeping things moving. Um, everybody had received those. Do any of the counselors have questions, comments, concerns, or how to proceed from there to wherever we want to go next? No, we're just gonna, we're good. Okay, easy enough. 
So the the comments um, it was they were basically and Marie and Liz correct me if I'm wrong they were uh, there were adjustments and finer tuned details to what the consultant had supplied and um, gave a more focused approach to how to involve or approach the nonprofits at the application level. Correct. Yes. Great. Great. All right. Are there any questions or comments then from from the public or nonprofits that are attending tonight? There is a consultant laughing. May I? So yeah, go is, ahead. Just to 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 clarify. Um, First of all, I welcome the opportunity to do this and, and thank you for listening to our, um, for, for accepting our proposed uh, grant application form. There is also a, as a, I shared with you yesterday when I sent the email with the proposal and, uh, um, and the other documents that I'm suggesting, um, I share with you that uh, I have invited a number of our partner nonprofits, our colleagues, to share background of the about the need um, in our community and to share ideas of how the need could be resolved. And since there is a, an agenda item that says discussion and possible recommendation of ARPA funds, um, we will definitely welcome the opportunity to share our perspective on about the need and also possible solutions and recommendations on what we could do with ARPA funding to help our community. Great. Um, Robert has a question. Good afternoon, Bob Gross, Long Hill Road. What, hey, what Bob. how you doing? When you say oh. not-for-profits, are you also including in the mix our schools and private schools and uh, churches and those included as a not-for-profit? Because they fall under that tax exemption. What, not, what, not, what, is your, not, what is your umbrella here? Uh, the Not the school system, they're getting their own ARPA funds, um, but I guess other than that, it's it's wide open to any 5013Cs, whatever they are, and all that stuff. Well, there, the, I'm not talking the Wallingford oh, Public Schools. To, to yeah, no, not Wallingford Public Schools. No, I'm, I'm not saying Wallingford Public Schools. There's other okay. schools that are private schools. Are they are they also qualifying? I, I mean, what's the umbrella you're 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 or the line you're casting here? How wide am I, I guess, going out? That's what we're discussing tonight. Okay. Any other questions or comments from anybody else? No, okay. Um, counselors then based on the, the information sent over starting with, um, I think the, the document that Maria sent over is longer. <clears throat> um, What is the interest in either adopting that, merging that, connecting that, um, whatever it may be with with the application process? And then the interest that we talked about in the last meeting was exactly how would the nonprofits be involved? Is there an opportunity to um, not just have them apply for funds, but to also include them in the process, process of administering? Uh, and we do have um, Ms. Miranda from Youth and Social Services here as well tonight. She was away last time, as I explained, and was not able to attend. Um, Amanda, if you have any comments, just pipe in. But um, I have a comment. Feedback. Great. So um, I do. So the I, I love the um, the application proposal that Maria sent over. I do think that it's going to be a little difficult um, in the realm of uh, the consultant running that because it's very open-ended. And I was wondering if there's anything that could be done to, um, like, to maybe make some 
uh, yes or no questions, things like that, um, because there may be, I don't, I don't know in the nonprofit realm how many or how few have received fu some funds or, you know, um, I'm, I'm just not sure if we should treat this like it's a complete intangible. Um, yeah. because it'll be really difficult for the consultant, the way that that is set up to, um, exclude anybody on the basis of open-ended questions. So we would be actually reviewing every nonprofit and that's a little bit, well, we being whoever, I don't know, whoever is, is reviewing these, I'm assuming the whole council, um, the would be reviewing every single application for nonprofit. And I mean, at a micro level, you there can be a lot. So um, I guess I'm just wondering how, how, if there's any way that some of these questions can be made into more objective questions instead of subjective. Um, I, and, and I guess that's really more of a question for um, Maria and the nonprofits on the line, but, um, you know, so I'm just putting it out there for the next time they're able to speak. Sure. And then, uh, and Maria, if you want to answer that question, uh, my, my reading of it was that we were going, that this was a kind of emerging, um, I think the, the consultants requirements were more black and white, yes or no, A, B, and C, uh, qualifiers and the, in your proposal was more for like a program or for content, um, that was kind of that gets attached to after you qualify, after a nonprofit qualifies. If I'm wrong, um, you know, explain that or kind of. Yeah, thank you. It's just, so nonprofits can apply in, 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 in two ways. One of them as a business and um, the, the I, that could be, that a application would look more a, like what you're looking to do, Autumn. Um, but the but an application for a project request it, it has you need open ended questions because you need to be able to describe what you're looking to do so you cannot do it with yes or no answers this this is it's just not possible that's why it is crucial to know and and i think that at this point it's, it's good that we're putting the, the the application out there but it's important also to establish who is going to be reviewing these grant applications because they are the ones that are going to be receiving the applications. They are the ones that are going to be reading them, reading them, evaluating them, and make a recommendation to you, the council, for a final approval, approval or rejection. So that has to be the process for that type of application. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mandy? Okay, sorry, I was looking for the button. Um, and I'm going to apologize in advance. I have a dog, and my daughter's leaving, so she might start barking. So, wait, <laughs> like now. <laughs> so, I apologize. <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't know if you guys can still hear me. Okay, so everything Maria was saying was. Um, was accurate um, from what I, my understanding. So with the application, when it goes into the portal with the consultant, I, I was under the understanding that it's like it's um, your basic information so that the consultant can then go and um, making sure that it's ARPA appropriate, right? Um, but then there's a committee following that that would actually go over the applications and, and reading through um, the programming um, ideas and then that committee would then come ahead, go forward and, and present it or however we, however the council could we figure it all out. Um, you know, on our end at Youth and Social Services, we, this, this is kind of what we do, you know, a lot of the time. I mean, this is, you know, you've got people coming in to the office, you know, looking for assistance for various things. Uh, and it's, that's part of our role in that office. Um, this is something that we can definitely be a part of on the committee, you know, and help with, um, you know, to to assist the group, you know, as a whole. Um, 
you know, that's something that we can, we're there for, and to, for the, for the, the, well, the entirety, really. So um, that's all I have at the moment. And if anyone has any questions for me. <laughs> Great, thank you. And we have a question from Councillor Zandri. He raised his hand earlier. And then we're gonna to go to Councillor Tess after that. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Yeah, I, I just kind of wanted to chime in on on the material that um, Maria Harlow sent over from United Way. And, and so there, there's really two elements there, right? You've got nonprofits that might be looking for funds for themselves and they want they need to be a qualifier like anybody else might. So that's that's one piece of it. Then the nonprofits may also be submitting a program proposal or a project proposal. That's the other element that's there. So um, I, I think when we get to that type of activity, this is the type of document that, that we want to see on top of on, on top of the you know, the other things that she sent over with the scoring elements and, and whether or not they're they're going to, you know, the scoring criteria, if you will. The, the other elements for this um, they basically outlined. They outlined the issue stage, the the issue statement, the the, the problem that the project is going to um, address. You know, uh, I don't want to say address because that almost makes it sound like they're going to solve a problem, but you're going to attack. You know, you're going to go after to try to resolve or mitigate um, what the what the population is going to serve on this. So in other words, what segment of people are they? Students? Are they job changers? Are they families? And so on. And then what, what, is the, what, what is the proposed outcome? You know, the project is here to assist with A, B, and C. When we're done, we'd like to see these people that are part of this project be able to complete, you know, steps one and two and be able to be positioned to do three, four, and five on their own. So this is, it's, a, it's almost like a business, it's a mini business proposal. You're basically coming in for funding to get a grant for this mini proposal. And we really should, include this as part of that project. I really think it's well defined and it lends into part of the discussions we've been having right along, which have been, how can we take this small chunk of money? I know 13, again, I want to preface that. $13 million is a lot of money for each of us on this call, but in the grand scheme of our budget and the grand scheme of $180 million with the ARPA funds that have already been dispersed, it's small. So we've got this opportunity to get a second chance for some of these places that maybe weren't eligible for certain reasons, had later impacts and projects where um, these other these other money resources were closed. And then, you know, we, we've got the opportunity to look at these other things. I would like to try to incorporate this and include it as part of the part of what we're going to be doing here. So I just kind of wanted to chime in on that. So thanks, Tom. Great. No, thank you. And, and I'll I'll loop us around to the to the consultant document in a second, uh, I think, but I'm gonna let uh, Councillor Tess to go first in case you know, it's got something different I want to introduce there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, maybe. Uh, first of all, I, um, from the uh, look of the agenda, I have you know, a lot I wanna discuss and suggest regarding you know, the overall use and distribution and so forth that I, I guess would be best held on held until we get to item six. Okay. Uh, but for now, on this item, I do have some questions for for Maria and others um, from her world. And uh, there, but I think we need to. I think we need to address one important uh, consideration up front, and that is we're looking at. Uh, the nonprofit agencies, if you will, in two different ways from the way we've been talking leading up to this point. And one is through direct contributions to their organization for whatever reasons uh, are in play, whatever it might be. So each social service agency, um, a not-for-profit organization, and there are so many, will have legitimate needs and they will submit applications for that. But the other part of this, which was a big one, was whether and or how uh, the social social service agencies would assist us 
in in administering this for individuals and i and that could be two separate things certainly they all have their own um clientele if you will but all the individual peoples and peoples oh my goodness all the individual people in town who might feel they have a, a, a need that we might be able to to address um they're going to submit an application to us somehow perhaps and we talked about having the social service agencies act as our screener clearinghouse uh, whatever you want to say so we need to keep that in mind they have we're going to look at giving the organizations money for their operations but we're also going to rely on them potentially to help us administer funds to individuals who may or may not be in their individual be in their own universes of regular clientele if that makes sense and i know maria uh, mentioned i'm sorry i'm forgetting the letters maria the wcra the wallingford yes. community resource alliance yes. did, I, did i get it yeah wallingford community resource alliance great can you clarify uh who that encompasses so may I go back a little bit before talking about the types of grant applications? Whatever so I think that there are no, a number of things that we have to we need to take in consideration here. But one of them is the type of, of grant of, of applications that we are opening to the public to that we're making available. So one of them, so for us, for purposes of the nonprofit world, I'm only going to focus talking about nonprofit world. Or, or, or grants to individuals. So in my opinion, grants to individuals should be handled by the Department of Youth and Social Services. That's what they do. And I think that they will require, they will require, um, a, 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 to, we have to come up with a, with a specific grant application for that specific request. For nonprofits, we have two options. One of them, is to apply for loss of revenue just like any business and we have to decide if that is considered as a this as, as an application for a business for a business or as an application or as a non-profit request and other thing that we need to consider is are we going to allow non-profits to apply for both or make them choose one or the other i think that those are important decisions to make so i can go we can go either way it can be a loss of revenue treated as a nonprofit because at the end of the day are nonprofits, but perhaps they are, if you are applying as a nonprofit for, for loss of revenue, perhaps we can put them in the bit in the business bucket. Uh, and that grant application will look different. It, it will look very similar to the grant application for businesses. The grant application that I submitted yesterday is, is a grant to is an application to be used for a nonprofit organization to propose a program to address a need in the community. And that grant application needs to have those open-ended answers because we need to be able to explain to you how, what is the need, what, what Jason Sandry was uh, describing a few minutes ago. Um, so that is that, but it is important to use the right application for the proper request because otherwise you are not going to be receiving the information that you need for each one of those requests. Another way is to do, a, 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 a Maryland has a, a nice application, is just one that everybody, all the options um, that anybody can use, um, inclu including uh, for municipal uh, capital projects. So that's something else to consider. But we as nonprofits, for us to be able to propose a project, we need those open-ended questions that are included there in that grant application that I submitted yesterday. And I thank Sean Doherty for helping me um, uh, with a lot of feedback for, for those documents that I submitted. So that is one thing that we put, can put on the side. I think that we can either continue talking about that, but I, but I think that it is very important to decide who is going to be reviewing these grant applications because that all of those this addition all of these questions will be resolved when we know who is going to be reviewing grant applications. I think that those things go hand in hand. The other documents that I attached are uh, 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 an application criteria uh, criteria 
uh, and the other one is is um, is um, the scoring sheet because I think that those documents give a very give a lot of clarity about what is expected from a grant application. We're all on the same place in in terms of what are we looking from from these applications, um, and then there is transparency into how these applications are evaluated. And people can know if they were approved or denied, what was the reason how their application scored. So that is one that is to put on the side. Uh, the Walling for Resource, the Walling for Community Resource Alliance is a group, is a networking, is a nonprofit networking group that has been meeting for a number of years. Um, it, it is run by um, the Walling for Public Library. So every other month for years, we get together, we gather the Walling for Nonprofits, nonprofits that serve the one that are not necessarily based in Walling for, but serve the Walling for community, the Walling for Public Schools, the Department of Youth and Social Services, um, other community partners, and depending on the subject, uh, sometimes they are uh, guests coming to share information. So what we did, so the the, the exercise that we are doing in the past few week, weeks, and this is not something necessarily new through since the time when the pandemic started, we the network of nonprofits have been meeting regularly to share and learn and understand the need in the community, the needs of the nonprofits, learn about what resources are available, encourage collaboration, trying to avoid unnecessary duplications. So that is an exercise that we have been doing over the years, but we started recently again, I believe, I don't remember if somebody can chime in, probably a month ago, two months ago. And the exercise that we are doing is, first of all, doing a brainstorm of what are the needs now in our community. So everybody had the opportunity because this is a group of experts, the same group of experts that are joining our meeting today. And I'm very grateful for all of you for taking the time to join us today. They have the expertise they have the knowledge so all together we made a list of all the things all the needs the current needs after we establish what are the, the, the categories that are a um, uh, more prevalent then we started sharing about what do we have now what services and resources are already existing that we can use and what how can we better collaborate so we are in that process and we're almost done. And then the next step is where are the gaps? And who, and, 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 and we are going to establish to determine who is, which ones are the agencies that are in the best position to address those needs, to fill those gaps. Because we want to be very strategic about this. We are doing it, yes, with ARPA funding in mind, but also with any other type of funding that we can bring to be able to execute this, this plan. Um, we are coordinating our resources in Wallingford. The, 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 the network of nonprofits is absolutely outstanding. It's when you're going to hear from them soon, and it's not only they're not necessarily all, all based in Wallingford, but many of them serve the Wallingford community, you're going to be impressed to hear the knowledge that they bring, the expertise, and the way how they help our community day in and day out, especially throughout the pandemic. So for us, that is why it is crucial that our town council, council and our community has a deep understanding about the need of our community, the challenges, and what needs to be done to help those who have been severely impacted by the pandemic or their situation has been exacerbated by the pandemic, how we're going to help them and how we are going to help them recover from this, which at the end of the day, that's what we're advocating, is the purpose of ARPA funding coming to our municipalities. So I know that it's a long question. I hope that a long answer. I hope that um, it answered your all your questions. Vinny. Can you clarify for me who who are the 
associated groups that are part of this alliance? Oh, so it's a very long list. So, well, if, I, I will be happy to send you a list. Many of them are here now. So it's Masters Mana, the Coalition for a Better Wallingford, the Wallingford uh, YMCA. The, the, so that's, it's safe to assume um, all of the organizations that we may be familiar with that are addressing um, all of the issues. I know Mr. Doherty has been adding some helpful things in the chat bar. Uh, regarding various needs, mental health, substance abuse, food insecurity, all of the yes. various problems we know exist. Um, you're you're pretty much a, an organization, an alliance that is everybody that's doing anything. Everybody. I and that's and that's great because see that allows me to know that okay when I'm thinking about the needs of the uh, that you address and I'm going to keep calling this individual needs for lack of a better term. I separate business, individuals, the community projects, that kind of thing. When I yes. think about individual needs, our 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 neighbors, oh, I'm echoing. I don't know why. Our neighbors, they're all somewhere or another, um, being served by the various groups that are part of your alliance. That's safe. Exactly. To say. Okay. Exactly. Absolutely. And that is why I can, I'm looking forward to the moment where I can, we can turn it over to our colleagues so that you can hear firsthand from them what, how, what they do. Well, and, and not to be dismissive, that, and that's not even necessary for me right now, down the road maybe. As long as I know that all those, those issues that are so important to us, there are the people that are, that are dealing with that on the ground are here are part of your alliance. So that's that's great. You know, there will come a time where individual organizations and um, so forth, whatever they may be, can present uh, applications to us, but now's not the time. Not, but now's the time to realize that uh, at least we know that there's a way that we can feel comfortable that all those needs are gonna be addressed. That's why I said, when we talk about individuals, we know that they probably can go through one or more of your organizations. That too, that's another yeah. possibility. Those are decisions that need to be made, yes. Both streamlines it, makes it more efficient, and it makes sure that we don't miss anything. Yes. So that makes, I'm pleased with that. So thank you for all of that. Yes. Um, one other thing I wanna just throw out there for now and I'll, I'll step back. I think it's important that, again, we, we come to grips philosophically with what we're really trying to accomplish. And by that, I mean, whether it's a business or a person, um, are we looking to reimburse losses? Are we looking to uh, potentially replenish savings? These, these are just ideas. I mean, when you talk about needs, when somebody used up everything they had, now they have nothing left and they're scraping by. Are we looking to pay accumulated debt? Um, some of this crosses over between businesses and individuals. We need to make sure we, we come to grips with what we think we can and should be doing. Um, when it, we're not talking about businesses now, so I'll wait on that one. But for individuals, um, I see people that, uh, and again, your organizations will be able to explain or identify where the needs are. I know a little while back in the chat bar, Mr. Crouch from uh, the Ulbrich uh, Boys and Girls Club made a great comment that uh, business applications, it sounds like they're more for general operating support, but program applications would be an investment in the future. That makes a lot of sense, but it also has to be some type of um, reimbursement for hurt and loss. And how do we identify that? In my opinion, frankly, we have say, to decide if, yeah. if, if we're going to allow nonprofits to apply for both or one or the other. And I have not had the conversation with my colleagues. To me, I'm just more excited about what Don is saying about us coming up with solutions for the future. But they may be nonprofits that they really suffer severe losses. Um, we, and they may be nonprofits that receive PPP monies, but PPP money, each, each one of the loans gives you three months, uh, three months of, of expenses. 
and you maybe have six months of expenses, but the loss could be much larger than that. So maybe a nonprofit needs that to be able to have to recover that uh, um, loss in operation so they can continue existing. Th those are decisions that we have to make. I, I do believe that nonprofits should have been given the, the opportunity to, I mean, they, they will decide whether they want to do it as a loss of revenue or they want to propose a program. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be easier for us to um, to identify and justify that any organization, you know, that, come on, come on, we all know you had no ability to raise funds, you lost your opportunities to reach out to the public. So when a when an agency, I know Mr. Welch brought up some important points, um, and all of you will bring up important points, when an agency approaches us and says, listen, we, you know, we we run on a certain kind of budget and you know we're tapped out so we need an influx so that we can continue to be a valuable viable operation that's legitimate without yeah. question and i'm and i can i can i can absorb that but and i don't want an answer to this now but when an individual says you know what you know i used up my savings to try to keep paying my bills and now i don't have any money in the bank you know, can you reimburse me to five thousand dollars I spent for the last year on rent? If we're going to consider that type of situation, that's a whole other world we have to talk about. Um, as opposed to, I am so far into debt and behind on rent and behind on medical bills, and I need help to get back on my feet. These are all different things, and I don't think we can. And I know we can't answer all that today, but we're going to have to at some point identify some things that we can do some things we think we should do and proceed accordingly i threw a lot out there but i just want that in the back of everybody's head and I, and I agree. yeah that and an the criteria the criteria the, the sample the first draft that i sent to you the criteria is so important yeah. um, but i think that you have the expertise from mandy miranda or adriana rodriguez from scout they have been doing that since the pandemic has started. So they have a tremendous amount of experience and knowledge on how to address that. We, I can I can assure you that our investments to help in the nonprofit world to help individuals in need. And Donna Dietro, I hope that she's here too. She's another perfect from new opportunities. She's another excellent person to share about that because we are always looking, we, we can help people who only, who, who need, if we give them, a push, they can they can get to the other side and they will be okay. But if it's a person who is deep in debt, and I mean, what are we going to do? We can we, we're not going to anything that we can give them is not going to help them to recover and to get to the other side. So we will lose the money. That is not the rationale to make those investments. So people who have the expertise in making those decisions and looking at the right paperwork and asking for the right information, for the appropriate information, they will know who needs to, who is viable and, 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 that, and, and a good candidate to receive that, that assistance and who will not be. And that is why like, the criteria is so important. The evaluation is very important. Transparency is very important because if you are denied, you will be very upset. But that's why we need to be very clear and very transparent about how we are going to make this these decisions. Um, so yes, people will may get upset, but they will understand the process is clear, the criteria is clear, and um, and we're doing the best that we can. Thank you. I will. I will leave it at that for now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm just, we're very fortunate that we have all of you, you and all of your colleagues, all of your other organizations as partners in this and giving everybody the, uh, hopefully the, com the comfort level that we look to you all as partners in this as we move forward. Um, that's going to make this, I think, as meaningful as possible. So thank you, Mr. Laffin, for uh, allowing me to go on and uh, I will turn the camera over. Whatever you need, Councillor Tessa, whatever you need. I love when you say that. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Mandy, you uh, had wanted to jump in, uh, I think, what, what was it, 37 minutes ago? Was that how long you guys were talking? <laughs> Sorry. Was that, 
Well, <laughs> well, well Councilman, that long? it felt like it was that long. I don't know. No, oh, that's funny. Um, Councilman Tessa actually made a, a lot of good points, and I'm so was, I don't know if anyone could see me. I could. My head was bobbing, and you know, in agreement with a lot of it. Um, you know, we do we get a lot of those individual phone calls, and you know, I'm you know honored to be a part of that, the Walling for Community Resource Alliance. You know, I'm we as youth and social services, we're part of that as well. So. Um, as as one of the town agencies on that committee um, or the alliance and having those conversations about you know the need and you know making sure we're not duplicating or we're assisting each other you know there's a lot of collaboration that's happening there you know, um, for us I know we get we get a lot of we're getting a lot of those individual you know family phone calls you know um, councilman Testa mentioned you know the medical bills we're, we're you know we hear that we hear I you know I, I calls about cost of medication and cost of of co-pays you know families looking for counseling um, and co-pays are so high that you know they need the, the counseling or they need to get to have the assessment done by a doctor in order to get the medication and there's all these steps and and it's it's a lot for people and COVID exasperated um, in, incredibly you know all of these issues uh, and we you know and we talk about savings right so you know people going into their savings accounts to help pay pay for things you know what about the breadwinner who is now sick with COVID and, and mm -hmm. can't work um, and having to you know go into like the college fund and the retirement fund the savings accounts in order to, to, to just do your 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 living. So, you know, it's it, it was it's great to hear that um, Councilman Tessa that you were thinking that way because I mean those are the, those are some of the conversations that I've been hearing, um, you know, from the calls that I get from from community members, and you know, as as our role in this through um, youth and social services and working with individual household that component, you know, that we've been kind of been talking about. You know, definitely something that we, like I said before, like we can participate in for sure. Um, I know um, I, definitely being a seat at the table, you know, being a member on, on some sort of committee. The My only concern would be um, the amount of kind of, of the, the work that's coming in. You know, like if it's solely on us, you know, we have one social service caseworker that covers the town. Um, so having a committee... Um, what would be helpful you know being able to kind of you know share the load we all sit together you know able to bounce off of each other it that would probably if if that were having another person to be able to kind of be the one to kind of spearhead it um you know whether it's another position created something um just as because of the caseload like you see, currently right now in our office, we're getting calls. I mean, where our caseload has, you know, the calls that we're getting, um, the programming that we have in our office is it's a lot. So I don't mean to go in this direction with this conversation, but I just just to let people know, you know, that and and I know the nonprofits are all feeling it as well with the conversations that I have had. Um, so kind of, you know, maybe you know us working together, collaborating somehow in some way, um, you know, as a seat you know, coming together and working that out, that would be an option. And, and whatever the council decides really at this, you know, what you guys think is the best route to go. Um, but I just wanted to throw the, that out there. So thank you. So so if we vote tonight to make Mandy Miranda the sole decision maker in the entire process, we're, you're good. You just said whatever the council decides. Is that decides, what everybody's saying? <laughs> all said and done. You just saved us four I hours. Put your hands down. They're all clapping. Stop it. <laughs> 30 earlier minutes earlier you should have spoke first why didn't you just say something i had a dog barking remember oh, yeah. <laughs> all right thank you uh, and uh mr ryan you were in the list there thank you counselor uh tom when appropriate i know right now the conversation is on the nonprofit community yeah uh, when appropriate and the conversations shifts to the business community I have a number of opening comments, and we also have invited a number of businesses to share their particular stories with the uh, subcommittee. So thanks. Great. Thank you. So yeah, so for the business, uh, small businesses, and I've tried to respond uh, to messages in the chat um, because of the legal structure and agenda, we need to focus on the nonprofit part right now, and then we can talk about everything uh, application-wise in the next agenda item and then the last item. 
uh, it can be a free for all for anything else we miss. And I mean, I will we'll try and be loose with that as well. Um, I don't want to inhibit conversation. Um, but right now, so we want to um, loop back around. Now, so a lot of people have written questions and comments, whatever. That is not saved as part of the record. It might stoke some sort of conversation or whatever. Um, and and I do save it in case we need it. Um, but if if there's anything you typed there that you you want to ask or have said, um, I would ask the speaker or, or speak because it's um, there's a lot of it in there and um, it's probably gonna, it might get lost otherwise. Um, the so going back to um, where we were earlier before Councillor Tessa and and Maria started the. So are we as the council and, and are we looking at then looking at the application, uh, the requirements that the consultant gave us as a qualifier in first and then the United Way proposed application for programming that comes after if you qualify uh, based on the first part, then, you know, we look at the second part. I mean, because I think that the second part uh it, it is open ended and it, and it has to be in that would that would have to be looked at i think by individual people trying to assess the needs um whether it's by this resource group or not um so i think if we start as a council of trying to stay focused on uh, and because it's the agenda item on the nonprofit application first are there components of the consultant's application for nonprofits that need to be adjusted that we can hopefully lock in tonight or move on from, um, whether it's by size, quantity, do we want everybody, you know, what is it? So it, there's limitations on numbers uh, of the employees, you know, full-time versus part-time uh, is, is not necessarily defined. Um, I think we, I think the general business practice or understanding is that that part-time hours equal up to a full-time and, and the business should be appropriating that. Tom, um, Tom, I have a question on that. Sure, Jason, thank you. I, I thought we discussed that the last meeting that we were going to start striking some of that language because it, it didn't make sense to limit the size of the of the nonprofit and the amount of employees they had and so forth. Yeah, and um, I'm just looking at now and I sent some changes. I don't see them unless I didn't upload the right one. Um, we did. We wanted to strike, at least in the business side. I don't recall talking about the nonprofit size, which is qualified. Um, I'm all for striking that out, too. Uh, and I, thought, I, thought we did. I thought there was an organization that was on the call last week that actually had more more people than that. And we used that as an example to also take it out of the nonprofit. And then the, the other element sure. was the other element was on the nonprofit one. It, it it was shoeboxing them into only making the request based on you know their their own impact as seen through COVID, and we were going to eliminate that. We were going to say, look, we want you to apply. If you're applying for yourself, outline state your case. If you're applying for your project, that was what the whole add-on document was for. Yeah. Um, okay, so if I may also. Um, my perception was if they are applying for themselves for like fund replenishment, we lead them to the overall consultant application. Um, and then if they are applying for a program, we move them toward the more open-ended um, application because there's, Although some of the income questions and the funding questions may be relevant, um, we would want to just include all of it at the same time uh, so that, you know, we don't come back and say, hey, we're, be we're considering you. Now here's a 17 more questions, you know, so we can say, you know, we can clearly map out somewhere I'm assuming the website or whatever if you're applying for um, this type of a this this type of funds these are the questions that will be asked of you so that you can have them ready if you're applying for this type of thing these are the questions that are going to be asked of you so you can have all of this backup and all of this 
narrative ready because it's right. the two things are different. So um, I do also agree that we should take away the empl the employee numbers, uh, you know, like under 25 full time that um, piece um, because funding is funding you know if it assuming that you have more people then you can assume that we're not you're not the they're not going to have to hire somebody to make this new program you know which is not an allowable fund under arpa so um just putting it out there Right. Thank you. And, and uh, some point of correction, I, I sent changes to the town clerk with the business and I didn't actually apply it to the, the nonprofit side. That was my error. Um, I, I didn't send the completed document. So um, referring to um, the business section in the backup material, you'll see the um, what we talked about last time with was, did you apply? Um, if not, why not? Um, if yes, did you get money? All those questions. So we want to incorporate those in the nonprofit as well. And we're striking the um, the business size, uh, operation size, I guess, employee size of the nonprofit and the businesses. Um, and then we want to, I'm scrolling past the wrong one here. And then we want to create two separate applications one incorporates basically with those other things stricken and and the did you apply in the past added it's the consultants nonprofit standardization and then we wanted two though and one is going to be for future programming versus just making whole Right? Did I miss anything there? Yes, yes, yes. That's per sorry. I was on mute and saying That's agreed. Okay. All right. Okay. So we'll have that marked up and dropped it. And then the so this resource does are the counselors interested in accessing the resource council, sorry if, I, if I'm calling it the wrong thing, um, and everything that that Ms. Miranda was talking about. Yes. Personally, I okay. think that utilizing the resource council for application review and, and in getting, um, you know, kind of farming out the type of applications and um, whether it's individual or programming, I don't know that it's it, 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 it's not so much for them to approve. It's more to make recommendations. But um, right, right, the, the council know, would need to approve. Yeah, of course. And and the full council, we are being very specific here. We are aware that as the five of us, we have no say in that. May I? I'm sorry to interject like this, but. There's I don't think you are, but go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> so the members of the of the Walling for Community Resource Alliance cannot be the body reviewing the grant applications because they are the ones that are going to be submitting grant applications. So we put ourselves in a conflict of interest. It is important to have, and also I I, I tell you, town councilors, you don't want to be the ones reviewing all the applications. <laughs> It's a lot of work. It's a tremendous amount of work. So I strongly recommend to put together a committee. So I, I, I can share the process that United Way uses. We have a process that is called allocation. So we reach out to volunteers, volunteers in the community to have different areas of expertise. First of all, we need, so they have different areas of expertise. Depending on the amount of applications that we have, we separate them into, into review panels, and they are charged with the responsibility of reviewing a number of grant applications. And what we do at United Way, we also, the allocators, set up interviews with the program staff. 
So any type of, uh, there, there's a lot of exchange there and to understand what the program is and to analyze the capacity of the nonprofit to be able to deliver the program and so forth. So then they have this scoring sheet and the allocators give a score the, the, the grant applications and then they submit them in this case, they, they submit their recommendations to the town council and then the town council will decide will be the will be the ones uh, uh, giving the, the ultimate approval or if there is something that you don't agree and you want to reject that's that's a different story but i strongly recommend you to have a group of volunteers in the community who have experience doing this type of work you need at least one or two people in that in that panel who has experience doing this type of work so they know what to look like um, and, and so they do all the like, work. They receive the grant applications. They make sure that the paperwork is attached. They will understand how to read the, 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 the uh, goals and the outcomes and the, the form 990 and the, the, all of these things that we do in the, in the nonprofit world. And then they, they, score, they evaluate the grant applications. They give the recommendations to you. And then you do the final approval or not. It's, it's my recommendation. If you can't have those who are going to be applying, you can have them reviewing applications as well because it put us in a tremendous conflict. Thank no, you. Sure. That's, I, sorry, I, that I sorry, that wasn't intend. clear. I meant in um, to for like individuals because so this agenda item we're discussing nonprofits oh. involvement overall, um, not just in giving money to yourselves. Um, so sorry, I meant in um, in giving. To, to individuals or whatever. Um, yes, we, we would definitely need to come up with a process for or a committee, as you would say, for assigning to the nonprofits for these these projects or making whole. Uh, Autumn, were you all set or Councillor Tess is also raising his hand? No, go ahead. I okay. just wanted to say sorry. I, I didn't mean to make that sound like I was making a call. Councilor Tessa. Well, that just messed everything up. Um, uh, Maria, I was thinking my whole plan going into this was like, okay, this is great. You all are going to take care of the individual applications for us. And now you're saying that that might not be possible. And I understand why. So that's okay. Um, but as you were talking about our need to maybe develop a small committee of people with the expertise to do this on our behalf. I don't know where we'd get them from because they're all of you. No, I, I have tons of, of allocators for United for the United Way process that I can reach out to and talk to them um, and put together. And, and not only me, my decisions, I talk with my colleagues from the, yeah. the Alliance and we think like all the people some, that would have that expertise are working for one or more of all of your organizations already. Yeah. Yeah, no, but they're they're volunteers in the community. So okay. That's, okay. That's how United Way has done conducted our allocation every single year. Okay. Um, so, and again, the, the the beauty of all of this is, so we need to have somebody that is going to be making these decisions. That is not us, the ones who are applying, because that is complicated. That makes it complicated. Great. Yeah. So, um, and so. Uh, Mandy and Maria, whoever. So, um, I mean, I still, I heard something different as far as I, I still heard that you could, or were comfortable in allocating individual grants, just not to each other, just to the other nonprofits. Uh, and that second part, uh, similar to, I know like the Rotary organization is made up of businesses and nonprofits. Um, and then they have a foundation that gives out money. Um, they don't obviously they're, they're, they divide amongst themselves and the uh, a pool that that gives a grant doesn't give a grant to one of the members of that pool. Uh, I don't know if something like that is possible just because as Councillor Tessa said, everybody is here. Um, everybody, that, everybody that we want to to give money to is also uh, would be our experts in in understanding the best allocation sources and and not that it's a you know i at some level we we have to have a level of trust um that uh you know one nonprofit is not going to make a behind the scenes deal to grants 
uh, a grant to another nonprofit in exchange because they're on different subgroups. But um, but the so just real first, real quick first on the the individual allocations. If if we're going to consider resources to be assigned to alleviate the stress or the burden that individuals experience the uh, Mandy, the youth and social services or uh, in this other resource group, you feel you could, you have the best handle on how to give some of that out or assign some of that or no? Oh, I would say we do. I think my concern would just be that um, it's easier working together with a few, I mean, it, when I say committee, I don't mean like this big broad, you know, this yeah. you know, 10 person. I mean, it could be a, a committee of, you know, you know, I don't know, three or four people, but or different from different agencies or um, who are doing the work, but at least it's, it's more, um, it's not just us. Cause I mean, we deal, we do work with a lot of people Within, the, I mean, that's our role, right? So working with the people in the community, and you know, and we're dealing with awarding. I mean, possibly, I mean, larger sums of money than what we would normally be working with, right? Yeah. Um, right. You know, so to have kind of that, you know, checks and balances, kind of um, almost, you know, as to who's, and yes, you guys are the council would. Um, if, I'm assuming through. Just as the nonprofit piece, I'm assuming I don't know um, that the council would also have the the final say with the individual piece, or is that? I guess it's my question. I guess so. I mean, it's um, so just having kind of more of the, like an, an oversight on the individual piece is kind of my yes, absolutely, yeah, yeah. 100 being at the table like. You know, being a part of that whole process, you know, you know, I don't want to throw SCOW in there, but, you know, working with SCOW, you know, because they're, she, you know, Adriana and her people are doing the, the, the same work too, you know, working together, um, but doing it more of like a committee, I mean, I'm quoting, um, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. No, I agree. And I, I, and we'll, we are waiting for their, I think, clarification. I mean, it may be. The council as a whole, not just the subcommittee, mm -hmm. may need to do some sort of rubber stamping um, uh, of, or the, we'll have the final like yes or up or, you know, yes or no, up or down vote. Um, but other than that, um, we'd be looking for the recommendations to come just as the whole council is looking for recommendations from the subcommittee. Right. We'd be looking for recommendations from the, I guess, the allocations committee, so we're going to call it, um, for the individual group. And then, however, we decide to work out the nonprofit awarding. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so that would be, I mean, that would just be my, I guess that's my recommendation is not, is not having it solely on just, you know, not just solely on, on YSS and solely on. Yeah, no, definitely not. No. Coming, you know, like I said, a small committee. It doesn't have to be, yeah. you know, a large number. Okay. All right. Any other? So a bunch of people have written in the chat. They've all written comments. Uh, Mr. Doherty, you'd like to speak. Uh, I do see that one. Um, if I'm, I'm going to scroll through the rest while uh, Sean is speaking. Um, but otherwise, uh, Lindsay Walters too. Sorry about that. I see your comment now. Um, well, you'll go right after Sean. Uh, thanks, and I'll be quick. Um, and getting getting back to kind of what Maria had mentioned. Uh, the United Way process, for those that um, are not aware of that, um, United Way has about 19, 20 um, agencies. We all apply um, for our project, our programs. Um, those uh, applications are vetted. Um, and then they're vetted through a panel. And that panel then also, um, you know, pre-COVID, you know, we were meeting with that panel. The organization, the agency would meet with that panel. Uh, describe their application. They can ask any questions and whatnot. And this was all; these were all volunteers. They're all impartial. Uh, but Maria, Maria, and her team would would coach them in regards to backgrounds of organizations and and what um, you know funding criteria and initiatives that the United Way is looking to do. So that process went very smooth. Uh, it was very impartial. It wasn't uh, favoritism was not in any anywhere in the mix and. Um, 
uh, we, at the end of the funding cycle, you know, we got our letters of what we received at the end of the day. So uh, I think that that would be a good recommendation. They have a, at least a background knowledge as well as the nonprofit uh, world. Thanks so much. Thanks, Sean. Lindsay? I'm sorry, in name and address or whatever organization you're from for the record, please. Hi, I'm Lindsay Walters. I'm the executive director for Merit and Modeling for Chrysalis. Um, I just have a, I have a couple of quick comments as um, you guys are making considerations or recommendations as far as the application process. Um, I am in the process of working on an additional transitional housing um, opportunity through um, federal funding. And one of the uh, critical out, outline elements in um, that application process is the establishment of um, MOU partners, but they, they take it a step beyond in the sense of the actual MOU should have an outline on um, fees for services. Um, so I think that would be a great way for some of the nonprofits to come together and kind of build dream and actually create more formal partnerships so that it's very clear on if I'm working with, I know Wayne's in the room from Women and Family Center, I'm sorry to pick on you, that Wayne knows exactly what he's getting out of the partnership over the next three years. Um, and there is a, you know, a means of payment reimbursement. I think those make um, the best outline so that you as a community know exactly where your money going is going to, what is going to make the big impact. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is that there are, um, I know there's a variety of needs that are on the table as of right now, um, but we talked about this earlier um, with Maria, is that uh, many of the faces around the room um, have been, you know, longevity in this community making a difference um, and we saw a lot of the economic downturn that happened in 2008 and I was also part of Wallingford in the plan to end homelessness and I think we have to also look at when we're making decisions around applications um, we have yet to see the fallout of the pandemic and also the kind of economic crisis that we're hitting into um, the housing market is going to be, you know, not what it is right now. Um, we were talk talking about helping families who never been helped before. And that's also kind of the area in which Chrysalis has a lot of expertise because we focus on domestic violence services specifically. Um, and we are that confidential entity that um, many people are very resistant um, in, you know, in domestic violence situations to actually move towards, I want to say, their natural helpers for support because of the shame, the embarrassment. And I want to make sure that as we're looking at needs, we're not just looking at where is somebody in crisis financially right now, but where are they could potentially be in crisis over the next three years. I think that's really critical in looking at, um, you know, how how we're going to help the community of Wallingford. Um, so those were the big pieces as far um, as, you know, kind of comments for you guys to consider. And like I said, I think the MOU partnerships, um, you know, it's one thing to say, oh, yeah, we're going to collaborate with SCAL or we're going to do this with SCAL, but to have real agreements on what people are going to get out of that partnership is really critical in making a big splash in the community. Great. Thank you. Adriana Rodriguez from SCAL. Hi everyone, good evening. Um, first off, I just want to uh, say my name is Adriana Rodriguez, Executive Director of SCOW, and for those, I'm gonna talk a little bit about SCOW for those that do not know the organization. Um, for the past 50 years, we have successfully implemented our mission of responding to the needs of the Latino community. Uh, we focus in three areas, social services, guidance, and programs for children, youth, and adults. And we have nearly doubled our services due to the pandemic, but we have definitely spearheaded different initiatives to meet the people where they are and make an impact. To um, piggyback to Mandy, um, we would gladly like to, or want to continue. We have been working and we plan to continue working together with, with everyone at Youth and Social Services. Um, we have the bilingual, 
and experienced staff um, who has already been spearheading um, programs where they provide directed direct um, cash aid uh, to those who qualify. Um, we understand that we might not be able to assist everyone these, with these funds, but we really do hope that we can alleviate some of the financial stresses that the individuals and families are facing with paying their bills, <laughs> purchasing food and basic needs. Um, we really, I, I would say that we would not only be able to attempt to narrow the already existing struggles worsened by the effects of COVID-19, but really help them move forward. Um, our community, our neighbors, they're resilient, they're hardworking, and they really do want to move forward, but right now they have to make these big decisions. And if we're able to really focus on these programs, working together again with all our partner organizations, we, we could put something in place, but again, please use us, SCOW. Uh, we will definitely support you at Youth and Social Services, but um, just connect all the community resources. We have wonderful, wonderful organizations that already provide the, provide the services, but why let's not, let's use them and enhance what they're already doing. So I just wanted to, once again, just uh, relay that information. Thank you. Thank you. All right, is, um, is there anybody else who wants to say anything that uh, a couple other people made comments? If you just want to leave them in the chat bar, that's fine. Uh, if you want to put, speak them on the record, this is your opportunity to do that as well. Um, counselors, otherwise, Timeline wise, uh, we have a council meeting next week and we have another committee meeting the week after. Um, looking for feedback, what do we be looking to, I mean, I guess we could do some sort of like up or down, just quick email thing, I think. If um, if the drafts are okay to send before, I, it wouldn't make the next council meeting anyway, so I guess we could just go to the next. So Tom, my, my only concern yeah. overall is we're, we're starting to back into budgets. So yeah. I, I want to kind of move the, move something forward. So um, similar to we what? do with ordinance, um, can we mark up the drafts to hopefully be done and then push them through? I uh, just, you know, have the, them reviewed via email kind of thing. I don't know. Do we need an official vote or are people comfortable sending it? on like what's the what are people looking for yeah I, I think it might make sense to vote only because i know that we've got we've got we should vote what we're going to send back to the council and all nine of us to review i i think okay great so are there any other changes that we did not discuss with well right now the nonprofit one because that's what we did first so Scratching the size, keeping the qualifications and the consultants uh, applicate, uh, draft application otherwise. And then the second nonprofit application is the qualifying standards as well as created by the consultant and then attaching or uh, changing those last questions into the program questions that were submitted as a draft. Well, hopefully then, too, but sorry hopefully too by the time we bring this to the whole council to present it maybe the consultant can update the their side if we send it to them to create like a, a proposed what would this look like yeah. um or how would the question series go um that way the rest of the council knows what they would be actually voting on sounds good because and then, um, yeah I, I know that they're going to want to have, like, everyone's going to want to have more input, so. All right, that's good, that's good on draft. So I, I guess we'll we'll have it official put together for the next meeting. Uh, Ken, uh, Mr. Walsh, you want to make a comment? Do you want to jump in now or you want to save it? Is it, does it fit now? Is that, do you think that's the best time? Your mic is off, sorry. Now your camera's off. Hello. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I, I don't want to beleaguer this point, uh, but I think it's it's uh, important to bring some clarity to it. 
Um, our proposal is twofold, um, and I think a lot of people's may. And that is that uh, obviously COVID had a devastating effect on all these organizations and society in general. And it's been spoken more than once that COVID exasperated some of the needs. So our proposal uh, talks about that need that was created during COVID, but it's gonna be ongoing. It's only a three year proposal and the need is going to go beyond that. But I think it's important that if the application is going to deal with this, that we make sure that it includes a need that was created or exasperated out of the COVID situation. It's really that simple. Yeah, I agree. No, thank you. Okay. And then, uh, Mandy, you had a question. No, I. I mean, there we go. Um, no, I, I know you guys are talking about the nonprofit application, but is, are you also looking at the individual application? Is, yeah, is so the way the agenda is structured, this was uh, nonprofit only, and so we'll okay. just uh, rule out the nonprofit now or rule out or be done, and then we'll move on to the other two. Got it. Uh, and the next agenda item, hopefully there's a lot of overlap in, as far as what we're looking for. But. Okay, thank you. All right, so counselors, uh, what are people, do, does anybody feel like we need to do a vote now? We're just going to have the drafts and have everything for the next meeting and do one big vote and be done. I think one big vote is probably fine unless somebody disagrees because we can't, I mean, all we're voting on is to move it forward. And if nobody objects to moving it forward, then I guess a vote is right. necessary. I just want to keep um, the. Um, yeah, I'm also good as long as there's no nobody that disagrees. Okay. I'm um uh, I'm, uns I'm unsure what you mean by one big vote. Uh, as far as like taking votes now to amend the drafts as discussed, and then have them come before the next meeting, and then set up all you know all these incremental votes now as, as what we're doing, or are we in agreement that for the next meeting? The drafts will be completed and presented for uh, a final vote is, along with the, the process changes. The final, the next meeting, meaning the next committee meeting or the next full council? council. The next uh, committee meeting. I would prefer a vote. You want to vote now on each step? I'm not sure what you mean by each step, I guess. So instead of going through uh, the nonprofit draft right now and saying, uh, you know, voting it up or down to make the changes and somebody making the changes and then doing a final um, a final version vote at the next meeting. Uh, I'm asking if people are comfortable just having us make the changes as we discussed and approving a final in the next meeting instead of having to do the incremental draft changes now as well. I would prefer a vote, but um... I mean, I think I think at the last meeting I said the same thing. Um, I prefer a vote each time. I I just I'm still of the opinion that we shouldn't be discussing the applications at this point. So I'm not in favor of moving them forward. All right. So um, I guess what do other people want to do? You want to do we make a motion to to vote or do you defer to to Councilor Tata's preference to just go? Each step, what do what do people want to do? I, I I think it makes sense to see if there's if there's a motion to move them forward as discussed or not that would be resident in the vote, and then we can figure out what to do. I think it's only fair because Councilor Tata doesn't agree with this, so and there might be you know we we should see how the vote goes. So I, I think it's appropriate to then take a vote. We're we're it's kind of one of those things like we're all not in agreement, so we should probably vote on it. Sure. So do you want to make a motion? Um, well, I mean, I guess the, the motion would have to be to take the aggregate, well, I guess what, the aggregate of all the changes we've discussed, move them forward for uh, a, final, a final document for us to review at, at the next meeting. Second. Moved and seconded by Councillor Zandri and then Councillor Testa. Any discussion on that motion? 
So, so just to just to make sure that we're you know we're all on the same page. I mean, we're basically, we're going to take all these these considerations that we've been talking about, removing re removing the element of how many employees. Most nonprofits don't have more than those that number of employees, but I didn't want to exclude anybody. So just removing yep. the number that was one element. The other element was to basically outline or or to better define the fact that a nonprofit has two avenues, if you will. They've got an avenue to make a request to get a grant to get themselves funding, make themselves whole, just like anybody else, the businesses, the individuals. And they also have that option for that proposal for grant for a project because it's a it's a separate item. I just want to make sure that they, they understand that there's a division point for them. You know, businesses, businesses and individuals are just basically saying, hey, you know, here's my situation, my documentation, and I'm making a request because I'm I'm shortchanged or however, you know, from from the whole COVID situation. So I, I want to make sure that we understand that's what we're putting together here to, to bring back. Yep. I'm any other questions, comments, Autumn? Are we going to review the proposed changes to the? Um, yeah. So, so Councilor Andrews motion is to to move forward all the aggregate changes, and then uh, so for the next committee meeting, we would have final document to for but just for nonprofits or for all three. Right now, this is just for nonprofits because that's what this agenda item is. Okay. Uh, then okay, I'm clear now. Okay. Great. All right. So, seeing no other discussion, um, uh, Madam Clerk, do you want to call a roll, please? Yes. Allenson. Yes. Laffin. Yes. Tata. No. Testa. Yes. Zandri. Yes. Okay, motion passes. Do we have any other official motions on the structure that we, we did include in the agenda as far as whether we want to make a recommendation for nonprofit involvement in whether it be the individual case? Now, we're, we are coming back in the next meeting. If somebody wants to put together a more formal, formal proposal by then, um, I don't know that we need to do it tonight. Well, so Tom, I have a question that may sure. or may not be pertinent to th this item. We're, we're talking about the nonprofits right now. Yep. What I, I want to ask the question, I see a lot of, we've got a lot of nonprofits on the, on the call and I don't know if people have been reaching out to one another or if we've been reaching out. I know I've spoken with some people, but what's the actual um, mechanism to basically communicate out to all the nonprofits that this is an availability for them to consider. Like, I don't know who's supposed to be reaching out, communicating, are we supposed to put a notice in the paper that we're doing this? Because I don't know how all the nonprofits are finding out, but I don't I don't know what the communication is either. I'd like that a little bit more defined if we can do that. Sure. Um, I think they all talk to each other, and that's how they found out. Um, between um, Ms. Miranda and then SCOW and United Way and everybody uh, in this resource group. Um, we, this meeting was posted as, it, as any other meeting normally is and uh, enough for one of those people are on that distribution and then it, it spread like wildfire after that. Yeah. Uh, a couple of nonprofits had asked me individually just uh, to let them know um, and I know that then they they all talk to each other so i think that's how that happened but as far as the government's mechanism or responsibility i think uh we just posted it and um this is what happened all right and then I'm, and i'm comfortable and i i see in the comments too you know that we get all the you know we've got a couple of, of major avenue points in but and i and i don't want to discount people's involvement because i think i think you know between mandy and maria i agree we probably could reach everybody but even leveraging them I would like to see something specific from from government. In other words, once we once we decide that we're we're all set to go, we approve the applications, we're 
we decide on some sort of alignment of what we're going to give out. When we're ready to open that spigot, I would like to see us do it's something as simple as on one of these meetings, make the formal announcement, okay, all the I's have been dotted, all the T's are crossed, we're going to start taking applications, and I'm just, you know, on this particular date, and there'll be a public notice in the paper. This way, we're covering it on the call, covering it by reaching out to these these big hitters that know everybody, and we're doing something formal as a tiny little notice in the paper. I know it, it could be argued that a lot of people don't get that, but it, we, to me, we remove all arguments of I didn't know, and I'd really like to see us do that. Yeah, I, then I think at the next meeting we can, we, I mean, ultimately it's the, the full council has to decide, right? So but if we want to make it that sort of recommendation, um, we would do that too in one kind of final report. Okay, it's good. As long as, as, long as we keep that you know, as a thought process, that, that would be important yeah. as far as I'm concerned. Sure. Councilor Tata, you had a comment? Yes, thank you. Um, in regards to what Councilor Zandri just said, um, there there are nonprofits um, in town that are not part of the groups that were discussed tonight. Um, I know two specifically um, have asked me about this and are not part of um, any of the groups that are represented tonight. So um, I agree that we need to make sure that everyone knows. And I think that's something the consultant could help with. Um, I know in other towns they've been doing um, you know things on their website they've been doing social media posts um i know that might be a little problematic here but um we uh we do definitely want to make sure and so um i think uh if we do go this route um where we're going to be giving money to nonprofits, we definitely want to um i think the consultant would probably have good experience with that and can maybe help us and guide us with that um and i also just wanted to add at this point because i think some of the nonprofits um after this agenda item might might leave the meeting so i just want to make sure i said it while they're still on um i just want to make it clear we we as a council still have not um decided exactly how we're going to spend the money so um you know while we're talking about the applications um for anyone who you know didn't hear some of the other meetings um one of my or my, my really my only objection to the applications at this point is just because we have not decided how we're spending the money um, so we're discussing applications and some of the other counselors felt that the applications were the best way to gauge the need. Um, but I just want to make it very abundantly clear that at this point, there has been no determination as to how this money is being spent. So I just don't want anyone, um, you know, feeling that, you know, feeling misled or misunderstood or, you know, thinking this is definitely happening at this point. Um, because it's still, you know, in discussion at the committee level, and then it still has to also go to the full council. Um, so obviously, it's good to hear everyone's needs and, you know, understand um, what's going on in the community. But I just wanted to make that clear. Um, and then for for my fellow counselors, I also wanted to bring up: um, we have still not received an answer as to the revenue loss. Um, I had asked the comptroller uh, twice so far. I'm going to try to follow up again this week. Um, but that's a that's I know I had talked about this, you know, a few few weeks ago or months ago, but that's a huge part of this because if we go with the standard deduction, then we have the $10 million basically free and clear. There's a few small, um, we can't use it for the pension fund, we can't use it to pay down debt. There's a few small stipulations, but basically if we choose as a town standard deduction, 10 million of the 13 million is basically spent however we want. And then the 3 million will have uh, stricter uses. If we do not go with the standard deduction, um, and this is the part some people on the call tonight might want to hear, it's much more strict as to how we can spend it, and it's much more limited. Um, and so some of the ideas that are being um, discussed tonight or on other nights may not even be possible if we do not go with the standard deduction. Um, so I think as a council, we need to um, very quickly find out what the revenue loss was for the town, what that number is, and if we are planning on using the standard deduction or not. Um, I believe in the, the CCM uh, toolkit that we all received prior to this meeting, it discussed that the deadline for that is April 30th. Um, so obviously, you know, having meetings every other week, that's fast approaching. And that is an, uh, you cannot change that decision once it's made. So we need to, we need to really decide, um, and I don't know if if that is our decision, if the administration has an idea of how that's going to go, but um, 
again, that's something very important that we, I think we need to settle so that we know exactly how we can spend that money. Because until we know that, we really have no idea what is even possible until we decide if we're using that standard deduction or not. So um, again, I will follow up this week with the controller's office and um, try to let everybody know, but I just wanted to bring that up before anyone uh, left the call. Thank you. Tom, I have a right. follow-up to that if appropriate now. Sure. So what is keeping us from making that determination? You know, we, we've tossed around a couple of different elements. You know, we talked about, I believe, Councillor Allenson tossed out three million. We talked about slicing that up, using the ten million towards you know projects for the town. Why why don't we discuss a why don't we at least put an item on the agenda for next time if you want to make it more orderly? But why are we not addressing that? Well, that, that could uh, come we, up with item six. Sorry, what was that? On our agenda tonight, item six. Is that item six? Okay. It's then I'll be making a motion. I, I, I wasn't sure if that was what was being defined for part of item six. Okay, that's fine. Well, I, I, get it. That's, I, I might be wrong. Yeah, but. yeah, item six is the catch-all. The catch-all? Okay, that's fine. We'll wait till item six sure. then. Yeah. Ms. Harlow. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, and probably this is this 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 part of the, the conversation is at the end, but I I personally don't think that one process excludes the excludes the other. I think that we can continue working on the grant application while we make decisions on how allocate money. I think that it is very clear that for us, the nonprofits, we have a very strong voice. In a, in a very strong need to demonstrate why it is so important to make sure that we make an appropriate allocation to our nonprofits. I think that, and I want a, the town council and the community to understand that our network of nonprofit organizations has a very robust presence in the community. We have a number of people employed in our organizations. We have a number of people in our board of directors and other volunteers. We have our corporate partners, we have our donors, and we have the people that we serve. So I don't know if this is the moment to talk about this or later is the moment to talk about this, but I request from this committee and also probably at some point if it's necessary to do town council at large, I request the opportunity to listen to my colleagues so they can share about the needs in our community, so they can, so the council and our, the community at large can have a better understanding of the needs and why we are so passionate about making sure that this money also is allocated into programs that are going to help to resolve the needs of our community. So I just don't, if this is the time, it's great. If this is not the time, it's okay. But there is a number of nonprofit representatives here ready to share and to help you to get that education and that understanding of what is going on in our community. We cannot look to the other side. We are doing this so you guys the council and the community understand why we are feel so passionate about the need to make an appropriate allocation from this money, which is the purpose of ARPA funding, to go towards supporting the recovery of our community members who are struggling. Great. I think um, the the vote tonight was to proceed with the application process, and I think the application. Yeah, going forward with that, it'll provide uh, all the nonprofits the opportunities to to apply. If we weren't going to move forward, or whether if there was a discussion and decision on whether we were not going to move forward with applications, that would be the time. Um, so I think it's important for the nonprofits to continue to be involved. But when the actual application process goes to the full council for approval, that would be the time to to speak up or to show up to that council meeting to make sure that the that the 
full council uh, moves that process through and forward. Um, and that would be the last place that it could stop. You have a four, five, uh, four to one vote on continuing applications here. Uh, so that the next part, uh, the next place that that could be challenged would be at the full council level. And, and I appreciate that. I just want to make sure because I hear a lot about the intent to give a very, very heavy weight to municipal capital investments. And that's why I feel that it's crucial and significantly important that you hear our nonprofit representatives to understand yeah. how those percentages have to be switched. Priorities are priorities. So I would like very much, and I would appreciate very much if we can hear our nonprofit colleagues tonight. Um, I think that the, the last item in the agenda allows that for that opportunity. But if not, then we go to the to the general town council meeting. It 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 would allow that last agenda item would allow because it, it's just general priority setting. Um, exactly. But again, like I said, you have you have four of the five committee members, um, you know, moving forward with the application process. Um, so I think it's. I think it would be more impactful to have it before the full council um, because that's where the vote could change or be lost. That, that's, okay. that's my opinion anyway. Understood. Um, Thank you. We're going to do Councillor Allenson and then Donna, um, you had requested to speak as well. I just have to defer to the council first. Go ahead. Uh, Sorry. And I wanted to express my thanks for everybody for showing up too because I know how hard everyone is working um, to put forth both a good application process and also to share the need in the community. And um, I completely understand and your message absolutely resonates with me. I do think that I do know that the other counselors are probably not going to watch this because if they were wanting to be on it, they would probably um, come to it. Um, so my thought is that it should be, it would be very much more impactful for you guys to all come to the meeting where we do have the vote on the splits because like I'm, you know, I, I have essentially put out my opinion from the beginning um, and and I do think that there is a huge need and I do think that town projects should be deprioritized behind um, behind the community need um, you know and this is not to say that we're going to allocate every cent of ARPA in the first wave of allocating ARPA cents um, but it, this it, I just want you to you guys to know that this turnout is amazing and I absolutely feel it in my heart and soul that you guys are partnering with the community and really want to be heard and I absolutely applaud you guys for for staying through all of this um, and for uh, hanging out with us this long and I hope that you will come back even if you talk more in um, this, please, please come back and talk to the rest of the council because there will be a, a bigger need there to one because the other four of us will not have heard um, this message necessarily, even though it's recorded. Great, thank you. And uh, I just wanted to know, um, uh, Larry Conley, uh, the, yes, the, we've we've stricken the employee references in the the nonprofit um, part, so everybody will be included, um, including the all volunteer organizations. Uh, and I'm sorry. And so uh, Donna from New Opportunities of Greater Meriden, thank you for waiting. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, I just your name and address for the record, please. Okay, it's uh, Donna, D-O-N-A, D-T-R-I-O, D -O -N -A, D -R -I -O, 55 West Main Street, third floor, Meriden, Connecticut, 0685-06451. Uh, uh, um, and I appreciate everyone's commitment 
to trying to make the very best decision about how to use the American Rescue Plan dollars. And while it's, it seems like there's a lot of money, it really isn't a lot if we really thought about it. And uh, we were open from um, March 20th, 2020, every day. And what I want to call attention to is that there, there were people who came in from Wallingford who may never have used services before, but faced with no job, can't get through to unemployment, don't have money for groceries, and literally, what do we do? And I think those individuals are, are still in that queue of needing some kind of resources. They may have gone back to work, but they're so behind and that they can't catch up. And those individuals are, are people that I would say the hidden. All right, they're going to come when we need them, when they need help. And then they're going to go away for a while and come back. And we need to have the financial resources to get those folks back on their feet because that's part of the economic development of the municipality. We know that there will always be a segment of our population, mostly people who are seniors who are living in, in subsidized housing or public housing. They are always going to need some kind of support and we have to acknowledge that because during the early days of the pandemic, those two, those folks were still coming through our doors saying, I don't understand what it means not to pay my rent. What is a moratorium? They didn't even know the vocabulary. And so I think for some of those folks, they just didn't have the information to know what they should do. But like all of us, we went to the store and bought groceries or we were buying paper goods. Some of the seniors didn't know what to do, so they ran out like the rest of us and stood in line, but then didn't pay the rent. So I think that now with the moratorium being lifted, that there's gonna be an influx in the next 30 to 60 days of people who will now be getting eviction notices. In part, maybe they should have paid their rent, but they didn't have the resources, or the other piece is, they just didn't know what the word meant. And it, it was implied, you know, don't pay your rent, it's okay. And how do we support those individuals to keep people housed? Th there is no place, there's no, the emergency shelters are few and far between. And our experience has been in Wallingford specifically is that landlords um, are um, charging more for the rent and security deposits because it's a way for them to um, recoup the money they lost during the pandemic. So that what we used to see was a house, uh, an apartment for rent um, for 1300. Now they're looking for 1600. And by the way, we want two months security. Well, folks, folks coming out of into the new normal, they don't have those kind of resources. They've already exhausted if they had any kind of savings or unemployment or they're going back to work. So I, 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 I think it's important to remember that it's not always who does the service, but who is the, um, who is the, the, the group of Wallingford residents that need the service and how can you best provide those services to keep them solvent and in a right place without creating more a strain in the family, especially when there's kids. And also, you know, we don't have a lot of mental health resources and that's looming as an unmet need, not only for adults, but also for youth. And so I would just say, you know, to keep those things in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Are, are we, all set with the, I think we're all set with the nonprofit portion. So we're going to move to the uh, the individual and business um, draft documents. That's this portion. Um, counselors, I assume applying the like changes to business nonprofit as, as we talked about, I assume. I mean, we'll look for a motion on that. Are there any other major adjustments that people are looking for in those qualifying statements or documents? Um, 
that we wanted to address now, members of the business community that are here. I know Tim Ryan wanted to speak, um, and there were others that have messaged me as well that wanted to speak during the business portion. But do any of the counselors want to get anything out now before we move to the public portion? Counselors, Andrew. No, I just kind of want to reiterate, you know, I, I'd like I'd like to hear from the business community now as well. I mean, I, I, I you know, I made my I made my general comments during the council meeting when we were setting up this committee that, I, you know, I, I'm looking for the biggest multipliers. And I, I implied during the meeting that I feel like one of the, the biggest ways we can do that are through these project plans that the nonprofits can put together. But I think at the same time, it's very important for us to hear from the business community as well, because, and this was another reason why I wanted that 25 person um, definition struck from, from their applications as well, because if we've got a little bit larger company or a mid-sized company or somebody that's, you know, a, a franchisee of a large chain, these people also employ staff where this is why I kind of wanted to see a balance between these things. If a nonprofit put together a program that retrained people and also gave child care so they could go to work for some of these employers and these employers had the ability to leverage some of these funds to set up extra training alongside the nonprofits to get these people up and working and there's a little bit more child care. These are all those multipliers that I was talking about because just like it's been said in the comments, when, when people are able to stand up on their own work for themselves, be able to handle and arrange care for their 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 children or their, or even their you know their parents if they've got elderly parents at home. This allows them to sustain themselves and that allows them to not only maintain their households, but they also patronize these businesses on the return side. So I, I want to hear the the creative elements as well from the business community. So I'm I I agree that we should hear them here. But I also encourage them to come back to the full council as well. Great. Yes, I agree with everything that the councilors Andrew just said. Um, see no other comments from councilors. We're going to go start with Tim Ryan, and then Maria Asensia. Um has been waiting a long time. We'll go to you next, but Tim Ryan's going to be first, and then we'll jump back other to some of the other. Uh, I see Ray Anderson has also um, had some good comments there too, uh, Mr. Ryan. Very good, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to the subcommittee. Um, so at, at one of your recent meetings, if not your last meeting, you would ask that the EDC and WCI, Walling for Center Inc. get together, collaborate on an application and make some recommended changes. You should have all those changes in hand. Uh, they were minor, um, but nonetheless, uh, you have them. Uh, to, to Councilor Zandri's point about redefining small business as something larger than 25 employees, uh, know that we certainly have no issue with that. We were simply trying to take and, and put some sort of a boundary on the definition of small business, but there are a lot of small business. If we raise that 25 to simply 50, we would open up to a, a lot of businesses without a doubt that have been negatively impacted. So I'll leave that at that. I, I want to address a couple of things, uh, and I'll be brief because I know there are some businesses that we want to, we want to hear from tonight. But um, in, in previous comments that I've made, not only to the subcommittee, but to the council about the intent of the ARPA money when it was first uh, released, um, that I've been challenged on that. There were some folks that said that they did not believe that the initial, initial intent was to assist business nonprofit. Um, and I just want to refer back to um, the document that first came out. It was May, or excuse me, March 17th, all right, coming up on a year ago, 2021. So we've been at this for an entire year, not this group, but ARPA has been introduced into the market almost a year ago. And acceptable uses of funds for local government under the American Rescue Plan, and there's an A, B, C, D. A, to respond to the public health emergency with, with respect to COVID-19 or its negative economic impacts, including assistance to households, small businesses, and non-for-profits, all right? Government um, projects is C. So my interpretation of that document, and I stand behind what I've said in the past, that there was a priority that was put in place when, when uh, the opera money was first released. What has happened over the last 12 months is that the scope has been broadened and the priorities have been 
I think at the convenience of interpretation by many communities have, have, have changed. But the, I, I have said repeatedly, the intent of the document is as I just stated, and I've quoted from the document's original release, May, March 17th, 2021. So I would just like for that to make that point. Um, there's also been some comments uh, either on the committee or the full council um, about the fact that small businesses have received so many other forms of CARES Act relief, from PPP money to EDIL loans to restaurant vitalization funds. There's no question that that has been the case. What we are saying at the EDC and those who advocate for small businesses is that this is a net event. All right, we, we through our application process that you have in front of you, uh, and by the way, we recommend that the means of determining how to allocate the money is to first determine where the need is most. And the application process will fulfill that need, all right? We do not need to fund fully every application that comes forward, but we because we probably we may not have the money to do it, but we will be able to determine the scope of the need by putting applications into the marketplace. When I say that, I'm speaking for not only businesses, but for not-for-profit as well. And I want you to know that the EDC completely supports the plight of the not-for-profit community, along with the plight of, of small businesses. So, um, so I, I just say to you once again that other means of CARE Act funding will be netted against any business loss that is brought forward, and the request for funding would be the Delta. All right. So I, I, I tell you from my experience, and I think you'll hear some stories tonight, people that will share it. Businesses that have been made whole, if they've been made whole with other forms of funding, are not, they're, they're not um, eligible for funding. All right. We are talking about all those businesses that have not been made whole. All right. And so with that, I, I'm just I'm going to leave it at that for now, um, because I really, I, I, you know, there's some businesses that want to speak. And I would ask them to, or I'd turn it back to you, Mr. Chairman, to give those businesses an opportunity to speak. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. We're going to move on to Maria Asensia. Am I saying that correctly? I'm sorry. Just name and address for the record, too, please. Yes, you're saying that correctly. Great. Thank you. So, yeah, Maria Asensia, um, do you need my home address or my business? I don't, I never did this before. I'm sorry. Either, uh, let's do, uh, if you, either one. Either one's fine. We 11, 11, I'll give you the business. 1114 North Colony Road. Um, so I am a business owner in Wallingford. I have been for, I just celebrated 20 years. Um, I own M Salon and Spa. Um, so I do have a salon and a spa. And, you know, I came on here um, to advocate uh, for small businesses, especially women, women owned small business and especially businesses that have been directly impacted. Um, I respect everybody that has already spoken. I respect everything they've said. I, I know that everybody is in need, but um, I really do think that we need to focus on the businesses, um, especially the small businesses. I mean, every nook and cranny of Wallingford is made up of small businesses. Um, so, you know, if, if things happen to the small businesses and we start going out, there's not going to be much left of the of Wallingford. We are the heart and soul of this town. Um, we keep people employed we you know and you know going by what tim said about you know we got some relief um those ppb funds didn't last long and you know we are still struggling especially um i know my industry um any salon owner i know my friend francine is on the call here and um she owns a salon in town and her and i um lean on each other and you know, it's been a rough two years. I mean, even though we got PPP funds, you know, um, we don't get anything from the state of Connecticut. Um, they've done nothing really for us. Um, I think we got a $5,000 grant for two years, which didn't really do much. Um, it paid for one month of my rent. Um, you know, we were shut down for three months. And, you know, any any discussion of anything for COVID that comes up on the television, through the news, you know, clients, people get scared and they don't come in and our business goes down. I've lost staff because they've actually left the industry um, because we've been impacted so much um, and having to train new staff when you're already at a deficit. Um, 
is it hasn't been fun. It's been a very stressful two years. I'm like I said, I know everybody's been through it, but I really do think that these funds need to be allocated to the small businesses in Wallingford. Um, you know, these other organizations or these other, um, sorry, these like town projects, you guys get money from the state of Connecticut. You get money for, you know, for Wallingford. We don't, we only can rely on federal funds. And if these are federal funds, then we need to take advantage of them. Um, and we need them to stay alive. Um, like I said, I am a small business owner, a woman, 20 years. I don't know how much longer these next three months I could pay my rent anymore. And then that's going to affect my landlord, who is a, a big part of Wallingford. And I know that, you know, then the, then it falls back on the landlords um, in their business. So it's a trickle effect when you guys are um, talking about funding small businesses. Um, we are a big part of the community. And I just hope that everybody understands that, you know, um, I didn't, you know, I'll give you a little personal. I don't want anybody to feel bad or do anything, but you know, I've put off having shoulder surgery for two years because the last two years I've had to work so hard behind the chair. I don't just sit and type on a computer all day. Like I work hard 12 hours a day behind the chair to make money in my salon to bring it in. And, you know, I finally had to have the shoulder surgery because I couldn't do my job anymore. And, you know, it, it, it was scary. It was very scary. So, you know, th th these are true small business owners that work hard. They're not people that, you know, just sit behind a computer or push papers. We work hard for our money. You know, I, I lose time with my family. I, you know, every little bit counts. You know, um, we have money at home. We have to, I have to bring home a paycheck. And if the fun, if I, if at the end of the week, there's just the money to pay the staff and the bills, then, then there's no paycheck for me. And that's, a, that's a true small business that people don't understand. And, you know, another thing is, is, you know, now with this inflation that is happening because of COVID and because of all this, it's tightening the rope around our necks a little tighter because we we want to we don't want to like kill the consumer and going up on our prices because there is so much competition and we don't want to lose business but it is the only way to make more money and but we don't want to you know put this burden on our clients who have been loyal to us and are trying their best to do their job to come in and, and take care of you know help us out um you know that I mean, like I said, my heart and soul is in this. I've been doing this for 20 years. I come from a family of business owners, small business owners. Um, I know what it's like to work hard and to, you know, to see my business dwindling every month and struggling to pay my rent is very scary. It's very scary. I, I love my landlords. I've been very blessed, but you know, it's it's very um, it, it's very tough. And you know, to to actually sit down and make a decision whether I can go on or not. Um, and look at my staff that I do have and, you know, someday have to say to them, we're not, we're no longer around. I mean, it's just not fair. And like I said, the state of Connecticut really has done nothing for us. I'm sorry to say, but you know, that $5,000 grant was nothing. And I mean, I even applied when we used to have to do the, the, the um, thermometers, you know, they, I got this big email, like, apply they got a certain amount of thermometers that we can get for free never got a thermometer i had to spend my own hundred dollars to buy a thermometer so you know i feel like any federal funds should be going toward these small businesses in wallingford because they are the heart of the of the town and like i said we we keep it alive and you know i'm i i could talk on behalf of me and fran because i know we are in the same we our heart and our soul and our work ethic is the same but you know i think about the restaurants like they got hit harder than we did and you know yeah they've gotten funds here and there but honestly it's not enough it is not enough we got hit with something that we didn't expect and we are all treading water right now so So thank you so much for letting me speak. If you have any questions, I am, if I've said anything out of line, I don't mean to, it's just that my my passion for this is great because like I said, I've been fighting a long time to keep my business alive and I really would like to move forward and stay in Wallingford and keep small businesses going. Yeah, thank you, Maria. We're gonna do um, Mr. Anderson and then we'll go to Liz. Davis after that, if nobody else wanted to jump in before this. Great, thank you. Um, I, I, I feel sort of humbled uh, after hearing so many comments that have been well expressed by so many tonight. 
uh, it, it's heartening uh, just to hear the business community and the nonprofit community uh, speak up and tell the story. Um, on a personal note, this is my one year anniversary as executive director of the Quinnipiac Chamber of Commerce. I was with the Greater New Haven Chamber, our Kalia Chamber, uh, for 14 months prior uh, to this. And I came aboard uh, when COVID came aboard. So you can blame me. What I've heard over the last two years in this chamber and other chambers has been exactly stories that uh, Maria Asensia just described. Um, they've been very frightening stories. Um, I don't think I'm being hyperbolic when I say that. Um, there have been a lot of uh, small businesses that have had to furlough their employees. Um, restaurants where we patronize them and later they were out of business. Um, retailers and uh, surveyors um, and, and it, it goes on and on and the list is on. Now some businesses have done very well. They've, they've been okay. But I also know within Wallingford, we have many um, small to mid-sized and large manufacturers, and a lot of their problems have been workforce related um, in terms of having jobs, but no one to apply. Um, no one's applying due to other social issues, daycare and, and other issues related to health care uh, and engaging uh, during COVID. Um, we don't have just one reason, I guess I can report tonight, why we are in the situation we are in. Uh, but it is abundantly clear um, that I have heard through our leads groups, in our uh, call outs to over 250 Wallingford based businesses that are part of our over 400 um, members in the chamber, that they have had to do a lot of refinancing. Um, uh, of their businesses. Um, they've had to uh, refinance homes. Um, they've had to, uh, particularly if they are the principal in the business, they've had to even not pay themselves for periods of time. Uh, so we have heard these stories. Have we documented every single one? It's impossible. But I think we heard tonight, and I can't uh, help but echo um, what Tim Ryan said earlier, because I, I, I really think that he made the case very clear that infrastructure in a community, as we can speak from a Chamber of Commerce perspective, is certainly an attractive asset. So uh, we respect uh, those on the council who would like to examine that. that. That's also a very key consideration, but recognize that the people within our community um, are also part of infrastructure of permanence. They are your workers, they are your neighbors, they are your people living uh, and working and breathing next to us. So we support them. We um, respectfully ask um, this committee and council have opportunities to hear from more people within the business community. And thank you again for the opportunity to speak tonight. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. Uh, Francine. I'm sorry, Vis Viscuso. France, yes, Francine Viscuso. No, address for the record too, please. Um, 857 North Main Street Extension. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I have to agree with Maria. Um, I'm also an owner of a hair salon, a Michi salon and spa in Wallingford. Um, I started my business June 2nd, 1999 in Wallingford. Um, I have to say March 19th is a horrible day for me. Um, and that's coming up that we were shut down. Um, you know, we are workers, like Maria said. We work behind the chair. We're not an owner. We're not just in the on, at our desk doing paperwork. We are behind the chair to service, um, you know, clients. Um, and it's been difficult, and it's still difficult. It was hard to be home for three months, not wondering if we were going to survive, if we were going to open. Not by anything I did. I was worried that I was going to lose my business, not because of what I did, because of this COVID. And I understand why we had to get shut down, but it was hard being home and just worrying. You know, people rave, oh, I got to stay home for three months with my family. My daughter watched me cry every day um, because that was my salon is my, my life. You know, I started that when I was really young. Um, it'll be 23 years this June. Um, I was lucky enough also like Maria to have a great landlord who was able to work with me. Yes, it was great to have the money from the government to help, but to lose three months of 
business is hard. It's really hard and it's scary and it's still scary. Like the news with Omicron, we had a horrible Christmas um, because of that. And I understand people are scared to come in. We've lost a lot of the clients, especially older clients, because they're still not coming out. Um, so I know this money help could help a lot, a lot of people, especially small businesses and the nonprofit. So I think it just needs to be fair all around. Um, like Maria said, if it wasn't for small businesses, I employ 15 people. Yes, it might not be a lot to you, but to me, they're part of my family. And I would hate to ever have to close my doors because of that. I love being in this town. I live in this town. And like I said, it'll be 23 years that my business has been in this town. So I think that the money needs to be allocated to small businesses also. We cannot be forgotten about. And I think just feel that it needs to be fair. Um, also with the nonprofit, everybody that has lost because of COVID, not because of something we've done, needs to be compensated. That money was given to the town to help those who were affected by COVID. I wouldn't be here right now if I wasn't affected by COVID. For me, it's really hard. I'm a proud Italian woman to come on here and to basically beg for money is not something I do. My mom and dad taught me to get up every morning and go to work and that's how you make your paycheck. Also like Maria, there's times that I'm not taking a paycheck. We are two income home. People feel that, you know, you own a business, you make a lot of money. You don't make a lot of money. You just, I enjoy what I do and I love what I do. I love my staff. Like I said, they're part of my family. Um, so to have to close would probably kill me if I had to. Um, so I appreciate all of you on the committee for taking the time. I know this has been a long year for all of you guys to have to do this and make decisions, but I really hope that you consider, you know, helping us small businesses just as much as any other um, part of the community. And, you know, just to be fair all around, I could, I should say, thank you. No, thank you. Um, and I'm going to highlight something Councillor Tessa just said. Um, we're definitely, uh, you want to, you know, specify that we are, nobody's concerned not including the, the small businesses. Um, part of this agenda item is is part of the application process and and, and going forward with that. Um, but we have, uh, so we have Ian Brooks and then Liz Davis um, and Councilor Tata would like to speak when the, the public is done speaking. Um, so we'll do uh, Mr. Brooks uh, first, and, then, and I'm sorry, and then Mike Terrace and then Liz Davis. Thank you very much. For the record, Ian, I-A-N, Brooks, B for Bravo, R-O-O-K-S. I'm on the board of Masters Manor for some years, and I've been involved uh, for many years. What's coming out in all of this tonight for me is that the interests and the needs of the community are all aligning together. The nonprofit organizations here and elsewhere tend to be uh, remarkably small organizations. And yes, I'm here to bat for nonprofits, but I'm going to suggest that the interests of nonprofits, those that nonprofits support, and the business community, especially the small business community, are exactly aligned. And that's what ARPA is for. And it seems to me that as everything gets put together, we hopefully together, all of us from town council to people here, others can work together to allocate money where it's needed in our community that we all care about. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brooks. Mike Terrace. Hi, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, we purchased the property, and I say we, I mean my wife and I. Uh, we purchased the property on the corner of Route 5 and Center Street. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that building. It uh, sits very prominently on the corner of the retail district. Uh, we drove by it many, many times, like I'm sure most of you have, and we all said, hey, somebody should do something with that building and we stepped up to the plate and tried to do something with that building. 
uh, we took a risk and we purchased it on December 19th. We had our closing, which was, as you know, just before uh, the pandemic set in. So as soon as we bought it, we had Christmas, New Year's, and then there was the threat of the pandemic. Uh, we we represent a lot of other landlords in town across the state. You know they're all going through the same thing. Uh, we have the we had the uncertainty of tenants not being able to pay rent. Um, you know how are we going to pay our mortgages, uh, taxes, our maintenance fees? Uh, there's all these costs involved with owning a property, and the only income source usually is the rents. So when the tenants are unable to pay their rents, it negatively impacts us. Now, the building that we purchased has commercial spaces on the bottom. So, you know, we were hoping to dress the building up, beautify it, bring it back to it, some of its original glory and attract some good businesses. And that's why um, before we even purchased the building, uh, we were approached by the Econ Economic uh, Development Committee, uh, Mr. Ryan, uh, we sat down with the town planner, and we could we could tell that the town had a vested interest to see this property developed and put to great use. So, right after we purchased it, we sat down with uh, an interested party who wanted to put a nice high uh, upscale wine bar uh, in that corner space, which we thought would add great to the nightlife of the town. Uh, would would work well having the Oakdale in town, so people could go for a night out see a show, have a, a cocktail or a coffee. And um, the, the prospective tenant agreed, they wanted to move in and uh, they came for a second showing, then a third showing where they were taking measurements and said, okay, we're gonna get these back to our architect and uh, move forward with this. And we said, great. And then about a week or two later, the governor shut down the state. Um, now, the other building we own is behind that on the North Colony side where we also have a barber shop. And as you heard from the previous speakers with their uh, salons, you know, being shut down for three months severely impacted them, which in turn had that ripple effect and, and affected us as well. So, you know, we went a few months without, um, uh, more than a few months with uh, a couple of apartments not being able to pay rent. And we were unable to evict them to get somebody in who would pay rent because of the moratorium. Um, on top of that, we had the cost of materials skyrocket from the, the time where we had signed contracts to have work done to the buildings to the time that work was actually being done on 35 North Colony. We had an increase of about 40 to 50 percent on different materials. So we were negatively impacted by uh, on several fronts. There was the rent, there was the loss of potential business um, moving in, and there was the uh, rocketing uh, cost of construction. So with that, I just want to wrap up and say, you know, I believe that um, this ARPA money would go a long ways towards, um, uh, or if it went towards more towards small businesses, it would go towards stabilization of our community. And um, I, I think that pretty much wraps up everything I wanted to say to you guys. Thank you, Mike. Linda Belly. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, it's um my name is Linda Belly. I own Body and Soul Day Spa in Wallingford. Um, so I just want to back up. Sorry. Sorry, can you hear me? Yep, just we just need the address too. Oh, 26 North Main Street in Wallingford. Thank you. Right up in Simpson Court. Um, so I just wanted to back up what Maria was saying that as you know, small businesses, a lot of that money would go a long way because we were closed for so long. And being a service industry business, you know, we couldn't do Zoom and uh, curbside pickup and delivery. So it really did impact the service industry a lot. So I just wanna say if that money could go to small businesses, it would really go a long way and be much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Hi, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak. Um, I wanted to just... I just address and everything for the okay, record. Yeah. All that stuff. Sorry. Sorry, no, we all knew no, they are listening later. It's just right out of the gate, I start talking. Um, 31 Odette Drive, Wallingford. Um, I am the executive director for Wallingford Center, Inc. Um, and for those who don't know what I do is, um, we work with historical downtown to um, take part in revitalization and preserving the downtown uh, area, as well as helping small businesses to come into town and um, kind of uh, demographically 
fit them to where might be a good idea along with um, EDC. Um, we also provide guidance with some small businesses to if we do get small grants available to them or business loans or um, industries that we know would be benefit for this uh, type of uh, grants, monies, loans, whatever, we try to uh, help the community in getting that available to them. So one of the first things I want to say is I know that um, Councilman Testa, I think I think it was Councilman Testa, who just said that we are definitely taking part in, in with the business uh, loan or the business granting of the money. Um, I think the thing is, is I want to go back and reiterate what Tim has said. You know, the original purpose of this was to definitely um, put forth small business, nonprofit, and residential. I, I am fully understanding about the community projects and all of that. I, I just, again, I'm touting and I'm preaching to the choir. I just think that these monies are absolutely imperative to the small business and their surviving. Um, and I don't mean that, you know, they've got PPP funds, they've got other personal loans, some people have got personal loans, home equity loans, if you will, for the smaller businesses, um, and that's fine. I think the problem is, is that we are, I don't want to lose the purpose of why we're doing this. Um, you know, I, I've heard from three people today, and I was hoping two of them would be here, but they're not, and I'll definitely get them to the council meeting. I mean, they've just been destroyed by this COVID, and um, they're on their last bits, um, and it's a, it's a dry cleaner and a catering business, and these are all pretty big names within the, the town, so they're known. Um, so I just think that I want to stress wholeheartedly, as Maria has, that the contention and the purpose of this uh, money is to definitely be focusing on the areas, business, nonprofit, and residential. Um, it is, it just utterly, I just utterly, I can't stress it enough. So my feeling is that obviously um, WCI and the EDC, um, I believe that there should be a commission to, or a council, so to speak, to, review the applications coming in from the business um, side. Um, you know, some people just feel that the application should be just very generic um, and let it let businesses come in and, and apply. I really don't think that's appropriate. I think businesses do have to be held accountable and how they do that is based on background information, including information about if they got other loans and if they've received other funds. Um, and I know that um, Councilor Zandri, one of his big issues is obviously that they've been funded and they've gotten a lot of money just in the town of Wallingford for small businesses. And yes, I get that. Um, but again, this money is to focus on that small business and, and not, you know, I, I don't have the businesses are not going after the fact that they want to expand part of their business. They're actually going after the funds that they are, that for the lack of a better word, make them whole. And it really isn't really making them whole. It is just getting back what they're, they're deserved to get back. So that's, I just wanted to make those few comments. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, thank you. Councilor Tata. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to touch on a few things. Um, number one, just for anybody here who doesn't know, um, I have worked for my family's business for 15 years. Um, so I'm, I'm very aware of the struggles of uh, small businesses. We went through COVID, um, had a shutdown similar to what uh, many of you are talking about. So, um, you know, I definitely can see this from, from your side of things. Um, because of, that uh, at our last committee meeting, I did get some flack for mentioning that $500 would not be a lot to some businesses. Um, we're talking about doing meaningful, um, spending this money in meaningful ways. Um, and when I said that $500 for a small business really is not a lot, um, I got some flack for that. And then we just heard a business owner today 
um, say that $5,000 in a grant from the state was nothing. Um, so I just wanna reiterate that to a small business, um, we need to give some, if we're going to be giving money, it needs to be some sort of a substantial amount that makes a difference for them. Um, I was looking up some other towns and what they did. So East Hartford, for example, um, they gave $10,000 was their upper limit. Um, so their grants for nonprofits and for businesses, um, they capped it at 10,000. Um, so that is just an idea. And there's, you know, you can look up East Hartford and what they did. And there's, um, they ended up giving it to 114 small businesses and nonprofits um, with that cap of 10,000. Um, we've already had one nonprofit request 225,000. So, um, you know, and we know, again, like we already discussed, uh, PPP alone in Wallingford was uh, upwards of $150 million um, to businesses. So um, I, I bring this up now because, again, I know the agenda tonight is about the applications. And once again, I would just like to say I think that we really need to decide how much we're going to spend before we put these applications out. I think we've seen tonight that um, we've had, you know, various amounts um, you know, kind of thrown out there. And I don't want to mislead anybody or make it very open-ended where they think that they're getting a certain amount and we have, uh, and the council, I should say, has no intention of that um, amount being put forth. So, um, you know, I thank everybody for talking, for, um, you know, sharing your, your situations with us. I think it, you know, gives us a lot to think about. And, um, to the council again i just implore everybody before we send these applications out i really think we need to decide how much we're spending um you know if we're going to put a cap on the grants how much we want to devote to each type of uh, project just so that everybody is very clear before they apply uh what is uh possible thank you thank you councillor testa and then councillor zandry Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, did I do that? It got something in your teeth. I don't think so. Go ahead. Oh, no, Richard, that's me. Uh, Do you want to go or do you want to skip over to Councillor Zandry? We can't hear you now. So There's something happening. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing you like, you like the background of a movie. You know what? Totally I don't have any other no, videos no, no. on. Go cool. to Zandry. I mean, no, 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 all right. So, all right. We'll skip over to Zandry while you uh, figure that out. Now, Councillor Zandry. Uh, thanks, Tom. Yeah, the wonders of modern technology. So, yeah, I, I kind of want to uh, dovetail a little bit on on um, two two things that that um, Councilor Tata brought up, and I'll, I'll start with the easier one first. I, I, I actually agree with her that, that we should basically figure out how we want to handle these funds. And, uh, and, and, I, and I would rather us do it alongside the application process, knowing that the decision on how to spend the funds really has to cross the finish line first, and then the application process, as far as I'm concerned, can be right behind it. And we also do not have to divide everything up right this minute. We can we can choose out some buckets. We can do dollar amounts or we can do percentages and start to get this money out there. And we've got other amounts held back, not on purpose for the not for the intent of just holding them back for no reason. But we may want to redivide them. We may make decisions that you know we want to do a certain amount for nonprofits, certain amount for business, then see some sort of a need shift underneath. And move them around. So I I want everybody to be conscious of that too. And I, I kind of want to echo what she said about catching flack. And um, you know, I I want I want everybody to understand this is a sensitive issue uh, for all all five of us. And I would say the 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 nine of us all together, um, the the administration as well. You know. We, you know, my family as well has had a, a business in town for 90 years, all right, and m most elements of that business are gone. The only thing that's left is the catering portion of that business because 
partly because people were retiring and because of COVID, we had to make changes fast. The, the um, you know, just like everybody else did. Um, there are definitely businesses that got shut down. As far as I'm concerned, some of them were arbitrarily shut down. There are ones that had to be closed. And then there were others that I questioned shouldn't have had to close at all and probably could have continued to operate, although they would have been receiving maybe only 20% of their normal customer flow. But these are all the different things that we're gonna analyze. And, and, and I wanna make sure that everybody understands that we need to hear every story that's being told and we're listening, but we, we understand we're not, we're, we're not so far removed from the business world that we don't understand things changed. Um, I, work, I work for Microsoft, it's a very large IT organization, obviously. My entire business changed. Um, I used to go everywhere all the time and then I did everything remotely. I was lucky because I could do that. There were plenty of businesses that couldn't. And even if it was mild and the government didn't do some shutdowns, people still would have stayed home and gone less to the hair salons and gone less out to eat. So we understand. So I, I want to just emphasize to everyone that we're, we're we're listening and we're doing the best that we can to move this forward. I don't want to think, I don't want anybody to think that we're not hearing you. I don't want anybody to think that we don't understand you. We may not necessarily understand the depth of your problem, but we definitely understand that you do have a problem. So we're, we're looking for ways to address it. And, and some of the mechanics of what you're hearing when, when some of us are saying things like, I would like to see an initiative to do X, in order for people to be able to do Y so they can get back to the businesses and do Z. I'm, I'm not saying that it's not important to get some money to help with rent or some money to help with back bills. At the same time, what I want to do is get some other people working so they're earning some money, they stabilize their own households and they return to your businesses. I'm, I've got pie in the sky thoughts of trying to do all of this at once, but while I'm doing that, I'm not short-sighted either. I, I understand if we only get households 70% of the way, and we only get businesses 70% of the way, and we get nonprofits only 70% of the way, that if we fall short in all three spots, people's households are not really making more money, so they're not really gonna go out and spend, and the, not, and the not-for-profits can't help everyone. So we've gotta try to move some balls forward, but we, we we are very critical and of of this time it's a tiny amount of money 13 million dollars when there's been 165 million dollars with the arpa funds sent out to businesses in the town and i understand that some organizations some businesses didn't get any of that those folks are the ones we want to look at first and we are trying the best we can to get every element understood. So I, I, I want everybody to understand that's critical for all of us. And, and, I, and I really hope that everybody understands that we're, we're doing our best here. We're, we're trying to get it so that we've got a, a self-sustaining mechanism that starts to turn here and it helps all of us. So again, I, I appreciate everybody's time and bringing this to all of us, to the five of us and ultimately the nine of us and, and we want you to continue to do so. I want to encourage that. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councilor Testa. Thank you. I think I fixed it. I apologize. Like uh, just for the record, I, I have a streaming app on my app MacBook. Sure. And early in the day, I, for the meeting. It's well, fine. I, I promise you, I was not using it. <laughs> uh, it was earlier in the day, I just had it open to do something, and then I thought I closed it. And all of a sudden, it started streaming some previews from Netflix, and I had no idea where it was and what was going on. So I apologize for that. Um, I was not watching TV. Uh, anyway, what, I, um, what I'd like to say is the following. I, uh, I wanna get to the, to the meat of what we're doing here. I have, I have some questions. I think I shared them with my fellow counselors not long ago, I may not have, um, but, I I believe that a larger percentage of our funding should be 
allocated to small businesses. I've never said anything uh, that would contradict that. I've been wavering, not wavering, but been going back and forth um, as to uh, how we should um, handle or even consider allocating to any community projects and so forth and so on. I'm very familiar with the language in the in the act. I've seen the final rule. I know the initial intent and so on and so forth. I know as even Mr. Ryan said, they, they mentioned small businesses, social nonprofits and individuals and so on and so forth. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna be making a motion shortly uh, as to a, a percentage breakout, if you will. And it will be, for the time being anyway, it will be 40% for businesses, 30 for individuals slash organizations, nonprofits, and 20% for townwide projects that fit the criteria with a 10% buffer to be used for anything else down the road. Now those percentages can vary, but you'll see where I'm coming from. So that's where that is. But I, there are, I mentioned earlier, what are we really looking to accomplish with this so that we can feel like we've met the spirit of the law and the intent of this law and we can let everyone in the community know that what we're doing is is fair and reasonable uh so i had come up with some questions that i wanted to see somehow incorporated into the business application and some of these may be answered but this is what i was thinking about and that was and I know we've already addressed this, but when we talk about other other aid programs that might have been uh, received by a business, I want to know in their applications how much of that was received, how much of it has been forgiven, because uh, in many cases, a lot of the SBA uh, SBA forgave a lot of the initial PPP money, um, and that's okay because that. I don't see how a business could continue to pay payroll when they weren't open. So I'm not holding that against anyone. But when I talk about what we can accomplish with the money right now, we look at what happened in the past and where are people today? So when we talk about money that might have been received, um, are there any remaining balances that need to be repaid? That's step one. Not everybody had their PPP money forgiven. So right at the top of the list, if you received a loan and you still have to repay some of that, it's a lot different than if you received a loan and it was forgiven. I think that goes without saying. Secondly, how was that money used? And my, I'm hoping I'm gonna to be told it was used on payroll. And certainly to pay operating expenses to keep you al alive. For lack of, I'm sorry, that was the word I used. Um, how much accumulated debt was due to COVID and how much of that remains, which is very similar to what I asked about individuals. So have you accumulated additional debt in order to keep your business going? Those are real problems right now that we can address. Um, and if someone is looking for a request for money um, to replace lost revenue, what are the plans for that money? When I th think about how to talk about this, I don't want to make it sound, I don't want to sound like a jerk. Um, but if someone says, I lost a lot of revenue and, you know, I deserve some of that back just because I'm used to having it. That's different than I lost a lot of revenue and so did all the people that I pay. And we all suffered because of that. So uh, what did your employees lose if you still have them? So if someone is looking for relief for lost revenue, is that going to be distributed to your employees, to others? Or are you gonna put it back in the bank so that you can get back to where you were before this all started? I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but we only have so much money. And prioritizing 
uh, is a difficult thing to do. And um, I guess that follows my last question said, including owners, are their employees eligible for lost income relief? And I said that because an employee, an owner is an employee. So I didn't, I wasn't implying that if you say I lost revenue and now I lost all that money I used to have in the bank, that's that's not the same as saying I lost my revenue, my living expenses, and I need relief for that. And I'm going to share that with all of my employees, but I'm one of them. And if you can clarify, this is what we're going to do with this money. And a percentage is going to go to me as the owner because I'm an employee too. That's great. And that's acceptable to me. So I'm just looking for clarification on all of those types of things. So um, I am all in favor. I've always been strongly in favor of uh, allocating a good percentage of this money to our small businesses because they are the lifeblood of our community. I would never dispute that. And nothing I've ever done or said would should allow anyone to think that I think otherwise. Uh, but I wanna make sure that when businesses are applying for this money, that they're able to address those kind of questions so that, frankly, there you know as well as I do, there are businesses that were far hurt far worse than others. And we heard from several tonight. And I want to compliment um, the professionals uh, from the hairstyling industry who spoke to us so eloquently. and. Uh, and that's an easy thing to understand. You, 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 yeah, you can't give haircuts on the sidewalk. You can't deliver haircuts. And if you could, that costs money. I know people have lost money trying to make a haircutting ban. I know that was just a nightmare for you. But there are businesses that suffered, but are back. And just how much do they still need to get back to where they were versus how many need money because they're still on the edge. They're still on the, on the, you know, barely open. And we need to find ways to differentiate. Um, I, but I've said enough, but that's where I'm thinking. And those are the kind of things I'd like to see clarified for us in these business applications so that the businesses that are most in need still uh, receive the assistance they need. And those that do receive the assistance um, are to the extent possible, are sharing that and extending that to those who are still with them, keeping them viable. Uh, so that's that. Thank you very much. I hope I made some sense. I think so. Uh, thank you. And I, I wrote down all the questions that we can incorporate into um, the other draft for the businesses that both WCIEDC sent and uh, with a consultant. Um, Mike wanted to jump in with a comment. Mike, are you still there? Name and address the record, please. Yeah, exactly. I, I forgot to give you my name and address. It's uh, Michael Terrace, T-E-R-R-A-C-E, and I live at 19 Doherty Drive in Wallingford. Um, and just the one point I wanted to make was that, um, you know, as all the money has been coming in, we've been putting all that money back out um, into the building itself. And we haven't taken anything for ourselves for the first two years. Um, that money, goes back into the community around us. So we're using electricians, plumbers, HVAC professionals, asphalt installers, you know, all contractors that are located in our town. So when I had said um, something along the lines of investing in, in us is like in, is a step towards uh, stabilization, uh, that's how I meant to say it. It's, you know, that money is going back out into the community and, um, that's pretty much the point I wanted to make. So thank you for giving me the opportunity. Yeah, thank you. And then uh, Tim or Liz, did you guys want to rock, paper, scissors over who was going next? Or tips first. Green light. Yes, Liz, Liz volunteered me. So that, and that's all good. You know, I, I really do want to take an opportunity to, to thank the commission, the committee, the subcommittee for your comments. We know you want to support small business to, to our from our standpoint, it's a matter of degree. And Councillor Testa, thank you very much for saying what you said. Um, I just, I just, as far as proportioning the money, I guess I see it 
differently in that I think the application process is how we determine the need. And because the priorities from my standpoint and from several others on this call are businesses, I'm sorry to have to repeat it again, businesses, nonprofit, and households, that community projects I don't think should have an allocation until such time as those first three groups, uh, the, the need in those three groups have been determined. If it's determined that it's less than $13 million, then whatever's left over, go to community projects. If we determine the need is more than $13 million, then there's some decisions that need to be made by the council as to how we fund the requests that come in. Um, so I appreciate that. And Councilor Tessa, um, I just I was looking at the application as you were asking those questions, and we can certainly um, phrase it differently. But question number or item 27 on the application, because um, it is our intention to I, I, I use the word or the term net event, which means you know no one's double dipping here. We don't want anybody to double dip. We are stewards of this money, and we want the money to go to the, for the purposes stated. But we have, please provide a written assertion that the requested funds are to address negative impacts of the COVID-19 public health emergency that have not otherwise already been addressed by government support, PPP loans, EDIL, et cetera. So to me, that's, that's the statement, that's the, that's the assertion that comes up with that net number. So, but um, I know uh, Councilor Laffin has, has made some notes. We will change that however you would prefer because we're both saying the same thing. We want to help only those who have not already received some form of restitution uh, for, for their losses uh, from those other programs. So again, I, uh, I thank you and would, would ask for you know, one more appeal to use the application process to determine the need before allocating the money necessarily. But if, if, if the, there's a propensity to allocate then I would, I would ask your consideration to allocate community projects to zero until at such time as we find out what those other needs are. And Councillor Tata mentioned earlier that, um, you know, there's, um, hey, Christine, I forget what it's, uh, it's, it's called, but it's the, um, uh, the, the, the town can use its revenues, revenue shortfall, there's a formula, uh, inflationary revenue shortfall, and maybe that could be the money that could be used because that's in addition to. So um, anyway, I will leave it at that. And uh, again, I, I really, I really appreciate. And I'm not being patronizing. I appreciate the work you guys are putting into this. It, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough assignment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, Maria Asensio wishes to speak again. So um, you know, I appreciate. Tim saying about, you know, the businesses that, you know, we did get some relief, but this COVID is not over yet. You know, we are still, as Francine said, like we had a horrible Christmas because of the Omicron. Like it's it's non ending. So it's it's not like it's over and we're just trying to rebuild. We are living this every day that, you know, they just raise the numbers or something goes on the news and we get hit again. So I understand like we we got PPP and yeah, if it was forgiven. And like I said, that was a year and a half ago. And then even if we did get EIDL money, that is now debt that we took on as businesses that we have to pay back. So I just want to clarify that, you know, restaurants, I could say for the service industry, restaurants, salons, we are still living because in this because people, like I said, they don't necessarily see us sometimes as a necessity. They will stretch their haircuts. They will do this, but it's only because people are afraid to go out and we are still being affected by it. So I do understand that you don't want to give money or you want, I, I respect the fact that you need to make sure where this money goes to. And I appreciate also all the work you're putting into it, but I really do think you need to look at the businesses and where, how much business they've lost and what is happening to them, like on a month to month basis at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go to Liz Davis next, but if the counselors want to, think a, of, of a similar motion to, uh, I guess, what Councillor Zandri had before uh, for the business and individual applications while she's speaking, that would be appreciated. 
thank you again for allowing me to just make a few more comments. Um, Councilor Testa and Councilor Zandri, I hope that I did not offend you and my zealousness, okay, my zealousness to just try to get my points across. As you can tell, I'm passionate about it. But absolutely, um, I appreciate that you guys are doing what you're doing. And Tim, you know, just reiterating what Tim said. Um, I did write down another note um, to talk about, you know, if any of those loans were provided and they had to be forgiven or they need to be paid back, what are they? So we have an accountability to the fact of um, one of your questions that you've asked. And I also made a note on the employees um, and bring that to the consultant because there's not much within this application that uh, addresses that. And that is a good point. So anything like that, as Tim was saying, uh, definitely is um, bring to us because that is what we wanna see. I think we, we, we think we've covered it all, but again, you don't want to make the application so lengthy that they don't want to apply either. So, and that's a, you know, that is one of the uh, considerations. So I appreciate it. Thank you. And um, that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right. Does anybody have a motion? Councilor Allenson. Um, I would make a motion to split 50% to, to first of all, divide the ARPA into 50% level. So we have 13 million, then 6.5 million. Well, our agenda item right now is for the applications. Oh, oh, then yes. So we have to, okay, we sorry. Have to, um, there, I'll move, I'll move yeah, that so. we move forward with the applications as amended um, amended by Councillor Testa and uh, Ms. Davis and Mr. Ryan. So moved. Uh, motion to buy Allison, seconded by Zandri. Yeah, second. Any other questions or comments from the councillors? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Allison. Yes. Lafton. Yes. Tata. No. Testa. Yes. Zandri. Yes. Great. Thank you. All right. That ends that agenda item. Now the last agenda item. Um, Councillor Testa and Allison looked like they had comments or things they wanted to say um who would like to go first Councilor Testa, your light is green oh uh, it's not intentional oh, uh, well. I, I i would like to say one thing to everybody on the call um the, there's no misunderstanding on my part ms davis oh my goodness i would i i don't even know why you're at, why you said that not even close um it's ironic. I mean we got a, we got everybody on there on a Zoom call and um and uh, I I, I kind of think sometimes what I'm saying is coming across the wrong way. And we're all here. But uh, no, I think this is amazing. But I want to make clear to the everyone here, you're all here and unless there's someone here I haven't that's been very quiet. Um you're here to advocate for the business community and the nonprofit and in the community. So for more or less, um, but I, I can assure you as a representative of the town, I'm hearing, I hear from a lot of people and a, a lot of people that want to see this money used for community projects. I don't agree with them. I mean, people say, let's do community pool. Let's do this. Let's do that. And my opinion on all of that is for the most part, if we want to do a community project, we do it the way we always have done it with our budget, with bonding, like we handle all projects. So I'm not and never have been in favor of using this money to a large extent on community projects as a lot of communities have veered off to. And I know that the prospect of that has always made a lot of people very nervous. 
Mr. Ryan. Um, uh, and I appreciate that. I respect that. You're like, wait, you know, don't go there. And I have no intention of going there. Um, but having said that, there, there it is still a, a, a realistic and a and a and a very real um, acceptable use of money. Um, if we can look at a certain project, especially something new, or an allocation to something community wide that can be associated with the spirit of the law. And I have a lot of things in mind that I think might work, but it's not a large percentage of this money. So um, as we're encouraged to please don't include community projects at all right now, unless we find out we're not gonna use everything and so on and so forth. Keep in mind that we're also dealing with a lot of people that want most or all of it used for that purpose. And when I, suggest to my colleagues and to you that I'd like to see us set aside 20% of this as a potential amount to use for community-wide projects that might fit the criteria. Um, it's not a great amount of money um, compared to the whole ball. And if we can find a way to satisfy the community as a whole, let them know in, in spirit we're trying to do what's best for the community and leave it to us to explain to them that supporting our small businesses and supporting our nonprofit and social service agencies with the, with the vast bulk of this money is in the best interest of the community so that we remain healthy and viable and economically strong. Um, I can do that, but I, I still want to have that option of doing a little something with some of this money um, and keeping 10% of it just not, a, not allocated right now. So if we come up short somewhere else, we still have a little extra money. Uh, so that's where I'm coming from. And in that spirit, as I said earlier, I am gonna take the first motion. Um, I'm gonna make a motion that we, that we recommend allocating 40% of our available funds to the business application process, 30% of our money to the uh, nonprofit uh, application process, and that includes individuals, and 20% to community-wide projects to be later identified by the council, with 10% being held not specified as all as a backup for any one of the three above. Uh, and that's my motion. Is there a second from anybody? No. All right. All right. Alrighty then. I pass. Um the so what one thing to note is that the timing of this meeting with the next council meeting, we wouldn't make the next agenda anyway, so we do have time. Um, I am gonna talk to Chairman Cervoni, um, cause our meeting is on Tuesday. Um, so I wanna make sure that, you know, if our meeting is after the agenda Sunday meeting that we, that he leaves a, a buffer that we will, we will have a, an ARPA committee sub report agenda item on that next agenda. Um, this, you know, we might not supply the backup for that until the next morning, um, but that will be in time to go out with the with the packets. Any mo any motion we make tonight of the type I just suggested can be on Tuesday's meeting agenda for this coming Tuesday or for the next subcommittee next council meeting. Why well, they they had the agenda meeting today, right? Earlier. No matter we do it, we wave rule five. Yeah, we could waive rule five. Yeah. I mean, this is a, well, this we also have item. the grace. We also have the grace period. The other that we outlined in the rules. If Just we have an agenda item, the report from the council, the subcommittee, we can make any motion we want that night. So this could be a, discussed at Tuesday night's meeting, some way or another, within the rules of the council. But sure. again, I'll, well, I'll, I'll, no one liked my. 
Um, we do have that in the rules. We did spe um, ask that we could bring forth amendments up until noon on Thursday. So we can ask uh, Chairman Cervoni if he would entertain that. Um, I do also have, um, I mean, this I, it, any motion that we make here is is essentially preliminary because the whole council has to be the deciding factor. My idea is to present to the full council the idea that we allocate. I'm going to just go on a hard number and say six million at this point with um, a with uh, three million going to business, two million going to nonprofit, one million going to individual. And so because and the the remaining seven million not to be placed as um, community projects, but to be used for later need or if we so far supersede our ask that we need to reevaluate um, the way that we've created these divisions. My intent is not to is not to belabor um, the disbursement of funds. I realize that people are hurting now. Um, we also have there are going to be ongoing issues regarding COVID, and I do want people to be able to reapply in a second wave of applications should that need arise. Um, so I'm really hesitant to blow all all of the money or to make a proposal to blow everything in the first um, go around unless we really see that there's um, that there, there's an extreme need. Um, so my it's not really so much emotion for tonight is more I'd like to get feedback from um, the council and you know who, whoever else wants to give feedback. I'm happy to take it. Um, I realize that this might be disappointing to some if we if everyone was looking for us to disperse it all at once. My thought is just I, I want to be able to mitigate future needs as well um, and have people realize that they may be able to that they can come back for a second round um, it, once these funds are awarded if the award if we only award the for uh, award i guess is or allocate is the word <laughs> thank you maria um <laughs> allocate the fund this the first six million um so i guess i'll leave it open to my co-counselors i don't know uh, i don't have a plan for the other seven million at this point um we don't know the need because because that's the nature of this beast you don't know what people need until they come up in front of you and ask you so um i just want to start it somewhere um and still leave that on the table if we were to should the need not meet the full amount which i doubt but should it not so i have a Point of order question, Tom. Yeah, and I I like to ask Autumn. I mean, Autumn, was that a was that a motion or did you want to just like throw it around no, this it's discussion? Like, well, because the thing is, I guess we can I can make it a motion. It's it just a motion. that I would like I would like to know what other people like like where other people's thoughts are because don't we have to have some sort of, we haven't talked about percentages and dollar amounts or anything like that. So if I make it a motion and nobody seconds it, then what's the next discussion point? So why don't we have a discussion? Make All it a right. motion, I'll second it. That's how we can talk about it. Make it a motion, I'll second it, I love it. Well, we can we can talk about it anyway. You know, yeah. a motion. So, what is I, easier to move things with a motion, but. So I, I would, I'd like to, so I, I I had said part of this process has been a chicken and the egg type thing. You know, we can't 
We can't take applications till we know what we're spending, but we don't know how to allocate it till we know what the demand is. So I, I think we need to start somewhere. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Autumn, since you're the one who's trying to start the ball rolling with the, our in the motion, if we if we make this a formal motion discussion and bring it back to the full council, are we gonna allow the flexibility to change your six million uh, allocation, if you will, and and or if we see sudden demand from one side, maybe scrape away another million or two out of the $7 million set aside bucket to address something now. What are your thoughts on that? I think that this is a starting point and that's my only intent is to create a starting point to propose without casting out any particular spending bucket at this point but without also being irresponsible and addressing the needs of the community first so i think so very much yes if if the new needs of this the community or one bucket far supersede where what we've allocated i think we need to address that with the full council but this is a place where we can say we can start taking we we this is what we know for now this is we're starting off the application process with these you know with these numbers as the intent um we take the applications and um and we begin to address the need because right now again not to steal your phrase but it's the chicken and the egg we don't like we're we're really running around ourselves trying to figure out which one we should come up with first and while we chase the egg or while we let it roll around in the road people are suffering so we need to address that no i i agree and i would i would almost ask you know maybe we could start it off generically i mean you you originally introduced last week you know one one and one or you threw a three million dollar bucket out there and we kind of carved it up one one and one since you're you're tossing around six million and saying let's let's station seven million to see where it might need why not go two two and two to kick it off i'm 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 also fine i'm also fine with that as a proposal i don't know if the individual need i i don't i don't i don't know like we just don't know where all the needs are you know so i'm i'm happy to do it either way i'm happy to I, I just, it yeah in. no i agree but so like so i'll right. use your example if if we allocated two to the individual need and it only came up to 1.5 we have 500,000 we could slide into another bucket right away Yes, I I agree. While you guys are, uh, Councillor Tata has been patiently waiting while you oh, guys are. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, sorry. Have, a, I have a comment. I, I didn't to realize that wasn't sorry, just a sorry. comment. Sorry. No, no, no apologies. Um, so two thoughts on this. Um, number one, like I talked about before, um, I don't know that we can decide this without hearing if we're using the standard deduction or not. And I think that's, um, Accounting wise, um, everything I've been reading, the final rule, the CCM toolkit and everything, I think that decision needs to be made first. Um, and without having the revenue loss calculation from the town, I'm not sure that we can make that call. Um, and I'm also not even sure that that's our call or not, if we're using the standard deduction. Um, so, you know, before numbers get thrown out, I think that really needs to be solidified. Um, and then just my second thought on this, it sounds like now maybe you're you're going towards more of an even distribution among the possibilities, but um, you know, I just want to say, and um, we heard, you know, we heard a lot from the nonprofits, we've heard a lot from businesses. Um, there's been uh, there there was agenda items tonight for the uh, nonprofits. We there, the applications from the um, consultant and the administration were for individuals, nonprofits, and uh, businesses. And um, I'm just not sure who's representing the idea for capital projects. I know I've been trying to talk about it because a lot of people have been bringing things up to me, um, and I've you know shared them with the council. I know I ran through a list last week. Um, at the full council meeting that that was not a list i made those that was a list that um you know residents and business owners and people in town 
um, ideas that they were interested in. So, um, you know, I guess if we're breaking it up evenly, that's, you know, a little bit uh, more supportive of it, but I just want to make sure, I just don't feel like that's really been given a fair shake at this point. Um, like I said, there really wasn't agenda items for that. Um, so I just want to make sure we're not losing that in the shuffle. Um, but again, the standard deduction, I think is a big deal at this point, accounting wise, um, because there's, there's very strict rules as to how we can spend the money, um, depending on whether we're using that or not. And, and like I said before, I will follow up with the comptroller's office this week. And as soon as I find out, I'll let all of you know, but, um, I just wanted to bring that up again at this point. Thank you. Great. And, um, then, uh, Mandy, uh, please. Yeah, I, what I was, my thoughts on that, on the, on what Autumn, um, Councilman um, Allenson had um, stated, I think it's, it's a great idea as a starting point. Um, you know, starting with something, holding money in reserve, um, once you, you're able to assess the need, the applications, I know Tim um, has mentioned this um, during his conversation, that yeah, we don't, we don't really know what the need is until the applications start coming in. Um, and I've had conversations as well, not knowing, you know, the need is out there, no question, but what are we going to end up seeing? How much, you know, what are people going to you know, reach out um, and what their stories are, even more so once you see those applications, you know, so to have a, like a jumping off point and then knowing that there's, there's money later um, if we need to. It's huge. I mean, I know, especially from the individual household piece, because it's hard for me to us even to throw out a number because I have I have no idea. I have no idea what who's going to come in um, and apply. You know that that broad of a or where it's going to be. And I may I may I could throw a number out there, but then that could be low. You know, and then it's like, okay, well, now it's been a couple of months and we're still getting applications in. You know, so just to be able to start somewhere, I think is fantastic. And knowing that there's there's a pool of money that whether it's small business, whether it's nonprofit, um, that you can tap into. Because there could be with nonprofits, there could be a, a, a great idea later on that comes up that because now we're, you know, once now the ball is rolling and programs are are being developed and it's like, wait a minute, there's another need, right? When you start to see see more, there's another hole that maybe we can fill or, or a program that we can enhance. And that might come later, you know, in this process. And to know that there would be a, a pool of money that we could tap into would be, um, that would be fantastic. And I, that's just my, my two cents. So I have a uh, I have a comment for um, when jump back to Councillor Tata. The, so if we establish a, a pool or a dollar amount tonight or even the next meeting mm -hmm. uh, before applications are are rolling, um, then what? Like so so if we say two million dollars um, for businesses, but we but we don't have any applications or anything yet. So there's there's still going to be a period of time and a process that has to occur before. We even get to a point where we can actually, all, or you know, execute or spend any of that money. So, I, I guess so. What's um, administratively? What is the what's the benefit to deciding on an amount tonight or at the next meeting as applications are going out versus waiting until the applications start coming in? Like we won't be able to. We could we could we could set aside six million dollars tonight. And we can't do anything with it because we don't we haven't done the, the application part of the process yet, or we, you know we, we need another week for that, or whatever. That's so I don't know if, um, if somebody has an answer to that or. I mean, from my perspective, yeah. if um, if we determine an amount to propose to the rest of the council, we can we're telling them how we propose these funds be used and um and like getting a jumping off point with the rest of the council saying we're not necessarily taking all of it so standard deduction aside or whatever like all of that 
like that can, you know, there's probably a good chance that you can still assess all of that and put some portion of this if that's what the rest of the council wanted to do as far as the remainder is concerned. But if we say for now, let's allocate six million and get and and let's let's get through these applications, what do you see as as call outs for um you know that you don't see on here or oh gosh call outs what a terrible corporate term um what do you see <laughs> as um you know some gaps or what do you want to see on this application that you don't see now and we have to work that through with the rest of the council because while we're workshopping it you know we know that others have opinions um yeah i mean if we were further i just, if we were in I just think this is the part. place to, this is the place to start where we're saying we don't know about that seven million at this point, but we know these things are hurting. These people, these areas of the community are already in need. So this is how we this is how we kind of push the ball off the hill, and then as it gathers trajectory when it rolls down, we can say, okay, now we you know now we know um a little bit more about what the need is and we can uh, adjust accordingly mm -hmm. yeah I, I guess my question is if we're not at, at a, an executable part of the process then does assigning the dollar amounts now do anything other than just saying well, when we get there, we're, we're looking at starting with this dollar amount i mean we know we're gonna we we assume right i mean do, do we think we're only going to spend six on these three buckets and have and have the rest no. available then for so it'll probably be more than that so is, is it relative to just start it off higher or that's so i'm not I guess, I guess it's a question for the whole yeah that's what i'm i'm trying to figure out but you know I, well, we can't decide anyway so like we mm -hmm. can start off there and say like this is what we were thinking but you know it's not um we, it's not an we, it's not an absolute sorry right but if we've got if we've well, got an council, amount councilor, and, and councilor tata has been waiting too oh yeah yeah go ahead go ahead yep thank you um in in regards to that when we're trying to you know decide amounts um you know i spoke a lot about other towns and i've been trying to see what other towns you know in connecticut and, and outside of connecticut are doing and i'm <laughs> I just I guess I would like to ask the council or or maybe even anybody else, has anybody seen a, another municipality that put out applications without first deciding how much money was going to be spent for the program that the applicants were applying for? Because I have not found one. And I'm just interested if anybody else has seen that when we're talking about how much money to spend on each of these. So I guess that's kind of to my point from earlier, where we're kind of doing both at the same time. I'd like to get, I'd like to get one over the finish line, the other one right behind it. I don't care if it's, if it's the applications and then right behind it, we decide six million or we decide six million and the applications are right behind it. I mean, this is why we need the flexibility to adjust that if one set of the applications is heavier or if if we're right on target we can get started right away if it's breaking down third 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 we're rolling and and i and i feel and this was kind of my point that from a, mi a moment ago we can make a recommendation if we go down you know three to two it's not a great recommendation to bring forward but if we're four to one or five and zero to go back to the main council say listen as a starting point we'd like to jump off from here and this is what we're thinking to start. Then they could always bring something up at the meeting and say, you know, well, did, did we think about this? And if we did, we could answer it. If we didn't, we could address it. So like, yeah, I understand that. I guess my concern is that I, I've never seen any other municipality do it this way. And what, my concern is that we don't have a program. Basically all we have right now is we're handing out free money and we really don't have a program or very strict stipulations or we're just going to say you know potentially 
um, $2 million to this group. And then everybody that is in that group apply. And then somebody who we have not defined yet is going to decide who gets that money and how much they get and who doesn't. Um, I just don't think we have a, we don't have a program right now. And I've never seen any other town handle it this way where they just decide a chunk of money and then have people apply, but there's no defined program. There's no defined limits. There's no cap as to each applicant, you know, is capped out at $5,000. Um, I guess those are my concerns at this point. Well, I guess I, I, to answer your question and, and be a little bit funny about it too, we're Wallingford. We don't do anything, anything like anybody else does it. And, you know, for better or for worse, but I, I agree it, it, it's not as smooth as I would like it either, but we're, you know, there are other towns that are already done spending their money and, and we're, we're so far behind. I, 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 I acknowledge your, I, I think I understand where some of what you're coming from. We could say 2 million and then $2 million worth of uh, applications could come in because we've set a bar and people are just going to rise up to meet it, but we've got to do something. And, 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 I, I just would like to move something forward to the council, is I guess what I'm saying. Yeah, I, and the dif I think the difference is that the other towns that already spent the money, they spent it on very specific items. So they decided we're spending it on this park or we're giving this program to the summer camp program. They had very specific programs that the, that money went towards. It wasn't just, you know, we're spending $6 million of free money, come and apply. Um, so I, again, I just I think we're lacking some specificity with this. Yeah, no, I think I think part of what we're trying to do with the applications is to establish those buckets, um, and then and then determine the amount. I mean, thirteen million dollars is the ceiling. That's it. It's thirteen million dollars. Um, really, to set a limit, uh, like if we use that six billion, the three, two, and a one, that would really be more or less establishing minimums, I guess. Um, you're you're committing to spend at least a million dollars on individuals um, because after that you you have this gray area uh, up to the rest of the ceiling of the 13 million. Um, 13 million is the total program and we are now trying to define the specifications as to the four different five different buckets um, whether it's community projects, individuals, households, uh, the nonprofit, make whole the nonprofit programs and then the businesses. Um, $13 million is the max. And we're now we're trying to, to fine tune that. I look at it as one big program um, that we're dividing out. Um, that's how I've been viewing it anyway. Councilor Testa, thank you for being patient. Oh, no problem. All right, for the most part, Councilor Allison's suggestion is very close to what I suggested for the first two buckets anyway. Um, I have said for months now, when we were first talking about this with the mayor, whom on and on and on, I have said, we need to establish priorities and set up some percentages of where we want this money to go. Then let's yeah. talk about how it's done. I've been saying that for months. I'm not going to stop. So we want to say, let's pick a dollar amount, go ahead. But then we're just going to be doing it again. I'm going to, inst I'm going to repeat myself. 40% is 5.2 million. Councilor Allison said six. So what's the big difference? I know how to do math. I said 30% for social agencies and individuals. That's 3.9 million. She said 3 million. And it said, let's leave the rest unallocated. I don't like the idea of leaving the rest unallocated because I still feel we do need to pay some attention to the desire of the community to do something for the community. Doesn't have to be a great amount of money. 20 to 30 percent is anywhere from two to three to 3.9 million dollars. If we say, as a council right now, we want to say as a standard, 40 percent of this money is going to businesses. That's 5.2 million dollars. 30% is going to go to social service agencies. That's $3.9 million. And the rest is going to go to community service, community projects, and or a buffer of 10% to see if we need to make adjustments down the road. That's not very different from what Councilor Allison is suggesting, but it puts numbers down. 
You want to put numbers? I'll turn them into numbers. I just did it. I said 40%. I'll say 5.2 million. That makes people happier. I don't care. Let's just make a decision on how we're going to go forward so people know what the heck they're applying for. Counselor Allen, uh, her whole said, thing was 6 million versus your 40%. If we said to the public or to the businesses or anyone, we're going to decide how much we're giving out based on how many applications we get, you know what's going to happen. We have to make a decision and set priorities as the governing body of this town with the fiduciary responsibility to represent everybody. And I'm not going to sit here and have anybody tell me that I'm not being considerate enough of any one interest group with the proposal I made, because that's not the case. The government could have said, here's $6 million, and we'd all be crying about that, or $28 million. And we'd all be saying, oh, I got to get 24 of it. Come on. Let's make some decisions and move forward. I'm sorry, I got a little emotional. But come on. Councilor Allenson. So your numbers are spot on as far as what I said correct um councillor testa except that i don't want to allocate anything to community projects at this point i would like to have all of the remaining that you're allocating to community projects be the buffer so i can agree with you on those numbers and i'm and i'm happy to put it forth that way um because i think that we're going to have to ultimately spend at least that um on these things but i don't want to allocate anything to community projects until I know that I've been fully responsible in my service to the people who, the people, businesses, and nonprofits who will carry forth um, our community projects and much of this service into the future. So um, I, I do just want to. Um, that is literally my only sticking point. I don't think that we should allocate anything to community projects until we have the need. It doesn't mean that we won't. It just means that we, it just means that we don't know yet. And it's, and I'm, I'm happy to take your numbers just the way they are as well. Do you have a motion, Councilor Allenson, is that what you're? Are you making that the motion or no? I'll make that the motion, sure. So can you state the motion? We allocate, I, I make a motion that we allocate 40% to businesses and 40% uh, of the total um, ARPA funding to businesses and 30% of the total ARPA funding to uh, nonprofits and individuals. Second. Moved in second, uh, Councillor Tata has a comment. Thank you. Um, two things. Number one, you know, I take umbrage to the insinuation that spending anything on capital projects is irresponsible. People voted for us, and when people who voted for us and who didn't vote for us expressed their desire to have capital projects as a big part of this. I think we need to look at that. And simply because that was not noted on the applications does not mean that not addressing that is irresponsible. Um, certainly, you know, there are very applicable um, uses mentioned tonight and discussed a lot. Um, but again, there is a big demand for projects. And so I I don't think cutting that group of our constituents out of this um, is a is a good idea or is uh, is serving a large a large part of uh, the Wallingford population. Um, the second thing, I'm just gonna say again what I said before. I have not found one town who is doing it this way, and I am I'm very concerned that we're just, I, 
I'm very concerned if applications come back at this point where it's just a pot of free money of what we're going to get. And I think we're going to get into a big mess of picking who gets what, how much they get when there's no caps, there's no program. Um, you know, we're kind of just blindly choosing numbers. Um, I, I guess just to put something forward, I'm not really sure exactly why. Um, I, I guess the, that's all I have for now. Thank you. Chairman. Um, Councillor Zadri is a, uh, comment first and then Councillor Testa. Yeah, so I, I just kind of want to, you know, add on, add on to that comment. So there's still $3.9 million that's available. There's 30% we haven't allocated at all. And I would argue too that this could go towards capital projects. This could go towards one of the other two buckets. If one of those buckets goes shy, you know, we, or I should say, you know, go shy on the application side and there's money left in it. We can move this, we can move it around. Um, I, I still think there needs to be more work. Yes. Are we going to put a maximum limit on it? Is there going to be a cap? And and how do we establish a cap? Um, if we're certain amount, certain number of employees, X number of dollars, certain, you know, certain size business, X number of dollars. This is this starts to get very difficult. And we could we could enter analysis paralysis and not do anything. I, I think we need to do this do this as we've established it right now. We're leaving the door open for the possibility of capital projects. That door is not closed. Um, it it is a balancing act of what we can do. I mean, if if we made if we made the cap just to just to toss a spitball number out there, five thousand dollars, we we could actually have a scenario where I don't care if it's a an individual or a business. An individual could request the 5,000, qualify, put it towards their rent and bills and still get evicted. A business could put for the $5,000 and qualify, get it, pay their rent, not be able to advertise enough and their business could still fail. These are risks. Um, so I, I don't know how to address every risk. I, I don't know how to guarantee that we that we go through the process of reviewing the applications as they come in and say you know how do we make these decisions oh that business will never make it don't even bother giving them any money they're gonna that that's we can't do that we have to put the we have to put a, a listing together a scoring value do they meet the criteria they're in a 90 percent bucket they they we're going to tear them all off and 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 have to be able to do it by having 30% unallocated, we still have the possibility of bringing up for a discussion with the full council, with our group. Hey, we want to consider a capital project. We can bring it up. Um, I, I think it's important that you know we we address all avenues with this money as we can. So I, I don't want to I don't want to make it sound like we're closing any doors here because I'm certainly not. Um, but I want I want to make sure that I I was making that clear by by what we're discussing right now, by breaking this into two chunks and leaving one chunk behind. Um, so that's it for now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Councillor Tad has a direct question for you. Oh, Councilor. okay. Yeah, thank you. I guess, so my question is, if if we're not if we're not cutting that out or we're not taking that off the table, then why isn't that part of the motion? Why aren't we putting capital projects on this right now? So I'm, I mean, I think I made it, you know, in the beginning, I kind of was, you know, more towards capital projects and, you know, as I listen more, I, I see that there's other needs and I'm like, I'm certainly willing to compromise here, but I don't feel like I'm getting any compromise. I feel like the capital projects are getting completely cut out of this. And I'm not sure why that's not part of the motion if our intent is to include those. So maybe we just want to make that part of the motion and then and then we're sure that it's included there. So I let me let me kind of describe what a piece of my concern is and if I'm wrong, then tell me I'm wrong. Here's, and 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 I'll kind of I'll defer a little bit of this to Tom because he might know the answer better than me. Let me just make a generic example, Tom, because I I want to get a little bit more comfortable around this. Let's say we let's say we decided to put 3.9 million dollars to capital project A. Would that be something that ends up in the budget somewhere? I don't know. Because here's my here's my concern with that. Okay. 
if, if we decided we were going to do project a municipal project a with 3.9 or, or 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 a bunch of them and it totals 3.9 here's what my concern is it ends up in a budget our, this budget that's it wouldn't be this one closing up but it would be the next budget it would end up being this this cap i guess it would go to cap and non-recurring have to go to a line item somewhere for it to be a capital project right to me that's no different if the, if the town council found 3.9 million dollars on the sidewalk put it into a project we can't compel the mayor to spend it correct when the mayor doesn't spend it where does it go sits there and where does it go when the budget closes it sits there still it goes to the general fund balance that's what my concern is that's what my concern is i want to make these funds executed i would love to find a way to get these things into projects that get executed but we as the council can't make the administration spend a dime so this is where i've got this big concern right now so I'm I'm willing to look at it and commit funds, but if I will, because here's the other thing, we can we can put it into the budget, and and the mayor either not spend it or worse, if he rejiggers it after that, and then we change it back, he vetoes that budget, we don't have seven votes to override that. Whatever he changes it to, is where it's going to go. If we put 3.9 in there for Project A. And then he changes it in the in the in the budget to project B. We change it back to A. He vetoes the budget. We don't have seven votes. It either goes to his project now or it doesn't get spent. And that's what my concern is. That's a that's a big concern for me, which is making me gun shy on this. Thank you. And uh Councillor Tad, did you have a response or are you ready for Councillor Test to go? No, I'm sorry, I just wanted to reply to that. So I, I think that's exactly why I want to do this because it's very clear to me from my reading and um, you know the reading of the charter, the reading of the final rule, that this money is ours to choose how to spend. Um, I do not feel this goes through the administration, um, whereas budgeted items, like, like you pointed out, certainly do. Um, so, I think we agree. I think we're just, I, I think we're looking at this from, from in, in an opposite way for some reason. Um, but that's exactly why I want to make sure that we put this money um, towards a project that we agree on, or at least some of this money, I should say, because it does not go through the budget and it, it's, it's ours to decide how to spend it. Um, and so, Again, I'm, I'm not sure why we're not. I think we're both saying the same thing, but for some reason we're, we're looking at it differently. Um, and, I, and I know the other the other thing too is that we had asked, um, I think at our first meeting for the the law department's interpretation of that. Um, I don't believe we received that yet, but that should be forthcoming, um, which hopefully will will hopefully will make that a little bit clearer. Thank you, Councillor Zandri, direct reply. Yeah, no, I, I wanted to reply to that. I, I'm kind of saying the same thing, Councilor Tata, but my, my concern is how do we execute that? If you, if we said we want to spend it on paving a road, how do we get that done? It's got to go into the budget. The departments, the departments have to go, uh, the departments have to be allocated to do it or we have to take it out the bid. Mike Radinsky's making a point, the money not spent have to go back to the federal government. Um, that might be the case too, um, but again, my my concern would be it, it has to go into the budget, and that goes that means we lose control of it at that point, and it goes to the mayor. I mean, we voted to pave Wooden Kaplan, and that didn't happen. So there's where my concern is. We wanted the end re the end result of that vote was to pave Wooden Kaplan. And it didn't happen, so that would be my concern if we pick the project. It, it might not happen. Councilor Testa, are we? Uh, can you hear me? Now we can. First, first of all, my computer went. My battery went dead right in the middle of the last conversation, and I couldn't get something hooked up very quickly. 
So hopefully you didn't think I just took my ball and went away because I was unhappy. So I might have missed, I obviously missed three or four minutes of what was going on. So step one, have we voted on anything yet that I missed? All right. We're still talking about uh, Councilor Allenson's suggestion. Okay, thank yeah, you. About, she made a motion, 40%. Yes, I, I was here for that, and then the screen went black, and yep. I panicked. Um, first of all, I would like to, I'd, I'd like to thank Councilor Allenson for her uh, uh, consideration and how she responded to what I was saying and uh, her willingness to make some adjustments and so on and so forth. And, and I also respect her forthrightness in stating exactly how she felt about where we should go and what we should not and should or should not commit to. Um, it's important that each of us do that. Um, I still disagree with her, but I, I respect her, her position on that. Uh, I feel strongly, as I said before, that we need to make a decision as a council on how we feel we're gonna allocate this money from start to finish. And we can make adjustments every day once we do that. But I'm not crazy about the idea of saying, let's take this certain percentage of it and move forward and leave the rest in limbo. I think we need to commit to, in principle, to some priorities. And then the specifics on everything we're doing is going are all going to come with time. So that's all I have to say about that. Thank you. Councilor Allenson. I just want to say, I just don't want to allocate all of the money yet. And that is probably a key phrase there. Um, I just think that, um, you know, I've thrown the word irresponsible around. I, it's not that I mean irresponsible because I'm certainly not trying to make it sound like some people are willy nilly, just whatever. Uh, not making considerations. Um, and I'm certainly not saying that I don't want to do any capital projects ever with the money, but I just don't think we should allocate that money yet. So um, that's a big key point for me, but that's all I'm going to say about it because, and I apologize, um, Councillor Tata, um, if I made you feel um if i made you feel uh upset about my wording um it's it's just it's just my wording um for lack of better word right on the front of my head um but i just i don't think um it's time yet to apply to capital projects um but i can i can get there and you know it is what it is. We have to bring it to the full council anyways. I'm just, you know, I'm I'm just trying to get it started because we could go around forever um, with this. So that's all. Any other questions or comments on the motion? been a lot of random chatter in the chat box if anybody wants to speak could you restate it um maybe your questions were answered or whatever mr gross good afternoon well good evening it's been going on a long time um i have a question you there are a few questions Councilor Zandri said something about reviewing the applications and so forth. Who's reviewing these applications? And we haven't gotten there yet. All right. Perfect then. How to Councilor taught us. I don't know of any other town, of course, you know, Wallingford Unique, that has doing it this way. They are having requests come in whether it's united way whether it's whatever they're coming in with a request for dollars and then who's ever determining what the dollar amount is uh, you make the approval whether that's the approval or not whether that project nobody's saying three million here two million here one million here how do you do you have an idea of what 
the not-for-profits are looking for? Do you have an idea of what the individuals are looking for? Then how do you allocate any money when you have no idea what they're looking for? You know, and I see some people nodding yes on the thing there. I mean, this is just, this is irrational in how you spend money. Um, just one, just, just one point of order, please. Um, Mr. Gross, could you please not, direct your comments specifically toward one particular counselor. I totally understand that you're expressing your opinion. I just want to make sure that- um, I don't know what you're saying to me is directing to a counselor. I was just asking a question of what the counselor said, and I was agreeing with what another counselor said. So I don't know what you mean by directing question. I'm not looking for any adversarial um, contest here okay, at all. Well, it was adversarial in nature, just so you I, know. What, I didn't hear what you said. I didn't hear what she said. Um, I said it was adversarial in nature, just so you know. I just am, am just making you aware. That's all. Thank you. To Counselor Zandri or Tata? I, I don't understand what you're saying. Okay. Um, to the question then, you there is the question of, you're going to put the application out there. Are you doing, when the people come back and ask for money, is it based on revenue loss? lost sales how you, you guys are unclear on that i don't know what the the answer is and so how would you have an idea of what you're looking for and how businesses or people are going to ask for money um are you using the consultant anymore yes so you keep mentioning the 13 million you're, if you use the consultant and if they're going to do reviewing of the applications because nobody answered what who's going to review the applications, but if the consultant is going to review the application and it really should be a, an, uh, a non-biased outside party, it really shouldn't be somebody who knows the people who are asking for the money, um, you're going to go through hundreds if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's what other communities uh, will go through uh, for the amount of hours that you're looking at um because this is a three to four year period um when you're asking for the companies that it was unclear somebody was saying that if they've received ppp money they're not eligible for the grant money or are they no the uh application was just uh gathering the information of whether they asked or not it was not a qualified question all right. Are you going to also ask if they received unemployment or other benefits? That is, I believe, one of the questions. Okay. Because I, the public, we didn't, the public didn't get to see these This, uh, the first application, yes, not with the revisions, and the second application, the one tonight, I don't think anybody's gotten to see yet. Um, I don't. I mean, I'm just at a loss here. I just, like I said, I've been following this from day one, and you guys know that I've been count, well, attending council meetings online since early or second quarter of 2021 when these started and have been asking why this money hasn't been at least projected out to some of these businesses or to uh, companies or people, not for profits. Nobody can say I have it. And the question I also had suggested was, and I remember the mayor answering, but the question was, the not for profits and so forth, the town should have been working alongside with them to help people there was there's a ton of money out there and there's still a ton of money out there that if you qualify for you can receive why aren't they helping and if, you know spending some money working hiring the consultants to get this money to these people why are we just taking it from the arpa money why aren't we going after the, all the pools of money that are available out there because that's one of the major things that arpa says in it it says that you should go after other monies first and the money, the ARPA money should be used on things that you cannot, that you normally would not be able to spend money on. So, I mean, I have a whole list here, but I, I'm, I mean, this is just, uh, I, I, again, don't know how you're asking for money, to, to divvy up money tonight. Send out the applications, get an idea of what you're look, getting, get what the demand might be. It might be greater than you think, it might be less than you think and then start splitting up the money the way it needs to go. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Also should go to some prof, uh, projects for the town. Most people are looking for that. Thank you. Maria Harlow. 
field it is, and it always has been my opinion, is very difficult to allocate money in the buckets without knowing what we are going to get. And I feel that we're very stuck in this pro in this portion of the process. So I like very much what I hear from Autumn. Uh, Autumn, I could that's something that I feel that we could get behind. And I do agree in her approach of let's take care of individuals first, businesses, individuals, nonprofits, and then what is left if nothing extraordinary happens with the needs of the people of our town, then we can we can invest those monies and the remaining monies into a, a municipal a work. I think that we need to, we, 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 first of all, and I'm very grateful for all of this work that is putting in here, all of this hours, all of this discussion is so healthy and this is democracy and it's amazing. Um, but I feel that I, I do agree with Vinny, we have to get moving, we need to make decisions. I feel that that is something that we could compromise with to, to get us started. I think that um, we do, the next step is definitely select who are the committees that are going to be reviewing each one of the, of the, of the processes so, and, and trust the process, trust the people that are going to be making the decisions and making this allocation because we're going to put people there who know what they're doing and who love our community. Um, that's my contribution. I do, I, I, I do just can, it doesn't get old. I don't get tired of keeping reminding people the purpose of this money. The purpose is to help those who are struggling because of the pandemic. And I think that we, that has to be our priority. And then we think about the rest. Great. Any other questions or comments from the public? Seeing none, we'll bring it back uh, for final discussion of the council. Um, I, my position remains unchanged as far as, um, you know, I think we should go out first and see what we need and then allocate. I think it's it's kind of relative whether, I mean, I guess we could pick the 40% now. Uh, I'm certainly for moving, doing whatever it takes to just move forward. Um, a lot of this conversation is, um, you know, we might feel better about having made commitments, um, which I guess is good. I guess it's symbolic in some way, but operationally, uh, if we can come back and change it in a week or two, uh, or before we even see the application, so I'm not sure what the the total um, success or victory is there. Um, but for the sake of just keeping this moving, um, and because we can change it later, uh, I'm fine with it. Um, Councilor Testa, I would I will remind all of you that we have successfully handled some important issues here. That is the structure of the applications we're going to send out, what we're looking for, and if we don't come to agreement at this point on what's, in, like what's important to me right now, I'm fine with that. That's, that's how this all works. We can make these decisions down the road. You know, it, so we're, look, we're doing like two or three different things at one time. What's important, unless we made a decision not to send applications out, which some of us may feel, but I don't, but the important thing is we've agreed that the criteria that we're gonna put out to the businesses and to the nonprofit world um, are getting finalized. And that's an important part of our role. So we should be, let's remind ourselves that that's a big part of why we've been meeting. It's only our third meeting. And we're not going to solve everything tonight. Um, we're getting an idea, I believe, on where each of us fall as far as how we want to see this money allocated as we go forward. And that's okay. We'll have those discussions every time we meet. We, we need to remind people that this is all not going to be resolved today. And some people may say, oh, I can't believe it's taken so long to get this done. We just got started. I'll remind people of that. We just got started and look where we are. Look at the folks that were here tonight that are interacting, sharing in vital information. So I'm, I'm, I just, you know, I want us to leave this meeting on a high note. We should. If we don't come to, and we're not going to come to an agreement on the money. That's clear. 
We're not going to be making a suggestion to the town council on Thursday based on a, a, a unanimous vote of anything. Uh, if we want to have a motion to present to them, go ahead. I might have lost what that was when I was cut off. You know where I stand, but I'm fine with waiting on that. Let's get, let's report to the council that we've, we're getting close to finalizing the applications and the final criteria, and we're going to send these things out, and we're going to let people start applying for money. I'm not very thrilled that we would be doing that without having set some firm priorities, but I'm just one of nine. And, you know, I'll keep fighting that battle every time we talk about it. So let's move along. I do have a, a question. Um, are we, these priorities that we're about to vote on, and um, Councillor Allenson, can you restate them in a second, the, the motion? Are we looking to have the full council verify or affirm that at this next mm -hmm. meeting? Or is this just, we're going to report this is where we are right now? as we proceed forward and what what were people thinking with that coming from my position where i'm not even i'm not all like oh we need to we need to make these allocations right now anyway it's hard for me to say so i'm looking to see what the rest of you want because otherwise i would say float it i would i would say it makes sense to to get their feedback at um this tuesday's okay. meeting and then we can like Councilor Allenson said, we can add it as the addendum um, tomorrow because if they if they're completely against this, I just don't want us to, you know, have another committee meeting where, you know, where we think it's going this way and then it's not going this way and then we, you know, we wasted everyone's time. So um, I would okay. like to get their feedback on it at this next meeting. Yeah, yeah, I, I would I, can you restate the motion. Do you want me to restate it or just just withdraw it? Because if we're just going back to them to like, I can go either way. Like either way, I feel no, I like we're, we're restating it so that we, uh, as, as the committee, we are making a recommendation of priority. Okay. Sure. So now, I, I, I think it's important that we we we've got the we've got the motion. We vote on it. Whatever the vote is, we can go present it. We can say, you know, Tom, you can say, you know, this by a four to one vote or a five to zero vote. We recommend doing this, and then we could just bring it to the full council for a discussion. Yep. And it may be it may be a, a two to three. You never know. <laughs> so um, the so my motion was um, I'm making a motion that we allocate from the ARPA funds 40% to small business or to businesses and 30% to nonprofits and individuals with. Uh, realizing that 30% remains unallocated from the total ARPA funds. All right, so it's 40% for business, 30% for nonprofit, and individuals with 30% remaining unallocated. Yep. Any final questions or comments on the motion from the councilors? Did that have a second? Yes, I that believe was. I, I, I believe I seconded that. So that it's still on the table in that respect. Yes. Okay. Um, well, here's my quandary. Um, I want to see the council con discuss this and know about our discussions. Yep. Um, and, but I'm not in favor of it because you know why. I want a commitment to some capital projects in our allocation so if i say yes we go forward it appears that i'm in favor of this as the way to go forward and i can make that clear on tuesday night anyway um, you can say no too it's no okay. i'm going to say no tonight but right it doesn't matter we i okay. want to make sure we make we, we allow the council as a whole to know what we've been arguing about what our feelings are on this and let's find out how they feel about all this and then once we get all their feedback we may be we make a decision there or we know where we're going from there well Vin, so. if if i might i mean vin you could i don't know which way you're going to vote but let's say this goes through you can during the council meeting say something like listen i provisionally voted for this or against this because i felt like we should define capital project and and the council might vote to send back you know if it's a five to four or six to three back to us as the commission 
to consider that, add that at your next discussion. It could always go that way too. Your vote is not binding you to. Oh, no, I understand that. I understand that. It's just I binding. The move. We're not going to resolve that among ourselves. Um, that's something well, that's going to be decided at a council meeting with everybody. And our job is to, well, work on the details. But I'm all right. I'm good. It's going to go to them either way. Councilor Tata. Uh, thank you. In in reply to what Councilor Zandri just said. Um, I assume uh, you are going to ask uh, Chairman Cervoni to add this to the next agenda. It, I think, as Councilor Zandri said, if we're going to ask the council or, or if potentially the council wants to edit this or accept it or whatever they're going to do with it and then send it back to us, maybe um, I just might suggest that we make that a possible action item so that they have the opportunity to do so just to keep it moving. Yeah. 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 Without question. Thanks. All right. Shall we vote? Yep. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Uh, you're breaking up a little bit. I can. There's just music, is all we can hear from your All right. Okay, I'll, I'll try now. Oh, there you are. Allenson. Yes. Laughlin. Yes. Tada. No. <laughs> Not watching a movie. Not watching a movie. Not watching a movie. I'm right here. Watch a movie. She asking for my vote yet? Yes. I just no. called. No. Zandri. Yes. Well, we'll let them know how we feel and we'll explain it then. Can I ask a question? I have did, to do this. Oh, sorry. I, Deb, did you get all the votes? Because I couldn't hear all of them. I just want to make sure Deb got them. It was three to two. Yes, I think I got them all. You thank did? You. Okay, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Mr. Chairman, may I ask a question of Mr. Doherty? Sure. Are you sure. on this call? Are you currently on a starship? <laughs> no, I am not. You, are you sure that is not a Federation starship? No, 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 no. That's my uh, living room. In time. That is a hell of a doorway. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay, that's all. I'm, I'm just looking at you. Going, you look like you look like uh, Captain Kirk sitting there. Oh, okay. Nice. Thanks. Very cool room. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great question, Councilor Tessa. Do you watch Star Trek? Is that why it's on your brain? Okay. I don't even know. I don't even know what Star Trek is. No. All right. Um, seeing no further business, we will adjourn the meeting. Thank you, guys.